the risk to our view is that inflationary pressures return and that can be a function of geopolitics. When things move this quickly over short periods of time, there's unrealized losses, there's potential for stress. Savings are running out combined with student loan payments coming back. All that does point to still more weakness on the consumer. You're talking about uncertainty that drives up the term premium. We're not going back to what we used to call the new normal. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Four-day winning streak on the S&P 500, set to make it five. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Lisa Rabbits and Anne-Marie Hordern. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, positive here by 0.4%. Bramo, we will proceed carefully, just like this Federal Reserve, ahead of CPI a little bit later this morning. Proceed carefully, although I don't really know exactly where the bias is in markets right now, because yesterday it seems like everyone completely discounted PPI. We got an incredible rally in bonds regardless. So how much is this market leveraged to possible disappointments more than at this point an overshoot in inflation? Because people want to have a bond rally right now. What a turnaround in this bond market over the last two sessions. We've dropped back by more than 20 basis points in two sessions. Lisa, to see the 10-year here at 457 and a 30-year, never mind 5%, all the way back down to the 470s. Kathy Jones put it well. There's a liquidity issue. There's something technical here going on. I do keep going back to what does it mean for broader markets and for an understanding of what this market is. If it is the deepest, most liquid market in the world that sets benchmark rates for everything and it's whipsawing around by 20 basis points, 30 basis points more in just a couple of trading sessions. We are really fortunate this morning to have Anne-Marie with us to work through the latest on Israel. The Israel-Hamas war entering a new day. Secretary Blinken landing in Tel Aviv today. The Israeli Defense Minister, Amari, warning of a hard and long, difficult war. Yeah, they're talking about a prolonged war. Right now, what we see is retaliatory strikes. These are airstrikes over Gaza. It has killed more than 1,000 Palestinians. But you do have this infiltrate on the border. 300,000 con uh, conscripts have been brought up by the Israeli government. So, it looks like they're about to go in for a ground invasion. That would make this incredibly difficult. Two updates on travel regarding this war. The U.S. cautioning its citizens against traveling to Israel. The latest from Sky News reporting that families of British diplomats are being told to leave. Pretty powerful address from the president yesterday. What did you make of that? Absolutely. He wasn't even supposed to be at this meeting. It was a Jewish leaders at the White House, and he decided that he wanted to go make another speech. He called it a campaign of pure cruelty. The president also denounced anyone that's offering any sort of justification for this. Um, he is getting high remarks from leaders of the Jewish community, even Republicans, for the speeches he has been given about the atrocities we saw over the weekend. The problem with uh, this whole situation is that, well, I mean, first of all, it's a tragic, horrible thing, right? Let's just say that as, as an outset. There's also an incredible amount of misinformation, and there are really conflicting signals. We've heard about Saudi Arabia and Iran having one of their first calls since they normalized relations. Unclear exactly what the tenor of those discussions were. Mm -hmm. We know that Qatar is involved in this. How does this end? Right? How long is this going to be? Who is it going to drag in? How many people are going to die as it goes on? And these are some of the horrible, tragic uh, things that we're all grappling with this we're morning. We're trying to grapple and get some clarity on some of the numbers as well. The State Department said the death toll among U.S. citizens has risen to at least 22. A lot more on that a little bit later this morning. If you are just joining us, good morning to you all. The broader price action ahead of CPI shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. We are firmer here by 0.4%. There's a lift in this equity market. In the bond market, what a run of gains we've had. Two sessions, yields lower in a big, big way. The 10-year back to 457. Yields up a touch this morning, Lisa, by a single basis point. It's CPI Thursday, in case anyone was wondering. 8.30 a.m., we do get that CPI print as well as jobless claims. The expectation is for a pretty much the status quo. Uh, although what we're watching for is goods reinflation, and this to me is really going to be key. If you strip out energy, if you strip out food, do you start to see things tick up in a way that makes people a little bit nervous about just where we are in this fight? At 1 p.m., U.S. Treasury is selling $20 billion of 30-year bonds. To me, this might be one of the most interesting parts of the day, given what we saw yesterday in 30-year yields, plunging the most since the March disruption that we saw uh, with respect to Silicon Valley B uh, Bank. And if you wanted more input from Fed officials, We've got more of it. We have Fed speakers, including Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic at 1 p.m., Boston Fed President Susan Collins at 4 p.m. They say the same thing. 
Um, basically, we don't know, and maybe on the margins, if the bond market does our work for us, we'll let it. But on the flip side, what do you make of the fact that yesterday we get the meeting minutes and people are somehow attributing the rally and bonds to that when it's literally the same thing that everyone has been saying? It's a strong nod to what's already happened. Right. Does it stack up with what we heard from Chairman Powell at the news conference? I'm not so sure. I mean, that's the sort of massaging that happens after these minutes. You think there was some massaging into the release off the back of the bond market sell-off we've seen? I can neither confirm nor deny. OK, it felt that way. It did feel that way. <laughs> President bit. Collins, a little bit later, had this to say recently, likely close to and possibly at the peak of the tightening cycle. More Fed speak a little bit later. Also, just getting confirmation of this. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken giving statements to the press with Prime Minister Netanyahu in the next 15 minutes or so. That's the expectation anyway, so we'll look out for those comments on the Bloomberg. Joining us now is Sophie Lund Yates, the lead equity analyst at Hargreaves Landown. Sophie, just to go into the CPI report a little bit later this morning, what are you and the team looking for? Yep, hi, good morning. Perhaps unsurprisingly, we are along with everybody else, certainly looking for things to have moderated. That is the word that I, I dislike it quite passionately, but it's one that we keep hearing. Um, that is the expectation. And broadly speaking, um, I'm, I'm feeling relatively confident that, that that is what we're going to see. But as you were just alluding to there, um, what I'm particularly interested in is what the core read is doing. Um, because I think a lot of people um, may get a bit carried away with that, with that overall figure, but actually... Um, that's not going to tell you the, the the whole story. And particularly for me, that one thing, um, if I had to only focus on one figure, it would be shelter costs. Um, that is something, a word you used earlier, uh, was kind of whipsawing. And that's been on a, quite, a, quite a ride. And it is such an intrinsic and important number to look at when we're trying to map the consumer demand and the consumer mood. So for me, shelter costs, really big one and, and core overall within that. Let's talk about that consumer mood. I feel stupid almost saying this before I've even said it. Alvia Mage, canary in the cold mine. <laughs> Sophie, really? Yeah, I know. Um, you know, this has been, um, it's quite a difficult one because, let, you know, LVMH, Q3 sales um, overall, you're looking at a 9% uplift. But by most standards, you know, people would say that that is, um, that is good going. But when you look at the the, the level of the slowdown um, from 17% in both Q1 and Q2, so um, H1 overall was was a 17% uplift, there really is um, a stagnation, that might be a bit strong, not a stagnation, a slowdown in growth um, in luxury. And the reason that this matters is that we know that luxury customers are some of the most resilient around. So if they are starting to kind of draw back, think twice before picking up that bottle of Hennessy, um, what does that mean for, for less resilient consumers within the market? So I do think that's potentially kind of a flashing, a flashing indicator on, on the dashboard for now. Sophie, a lot of people might agree with this, right? They say that there is some sort of slowdown in consumer spending. But then they say, we're still bullish because that's a perfect slowdown. It's just enough to keep things uh, tamped down and to keep the disinflation trend. And it's already been priced in. Where is the distinction for you of what's been priced in and what hasn't been priced in? Where is the bias right now in equity markets heading into this CPI print? Sure. So I do think that some corners of, of luxury, unfortunately, do have a little bit further to fall. You know, we saw a relatively sharp reaction for, for LVMH. I'm not talking about, you know, the bottom falling out of share prices, but I do think that there is potentially still a little bit too much excitement there. Not all luxury names are created equal. Um, they don't all have the same um, the same kind of prowess and, and, and strength going into this. Um, and also, I think travel particularly. I've been quite bullish on travel. I think the way that we have categorized travel spend and we know that particularly um, in, in the US as well people are really prioritizing experience spending that plays into travel stocks but some of the bounces that we've seen over the last you know six to 12 months really is indicative of this idea that we think that um, everything is mission complete and, and everything is now going to be smooth sailing from here and I do actually think particularly as we look into Q1 um, next year, we could see more of a dramatic pullback on load factors, therefore margins um, in, in some of those in some of those big travel stocks. So I think that that is um, something that I'll be I'll be watching for sure. There are a number of sleeper stories that somehow have gotten off the radar, including the ongoing auto worker strike, which we have seen uh, actually percolate over to some of the most profitable Ford vehicle uh, manufacturing outlets. We also we're talking about some sort of ceasefire, at least in the strike. Uh, bad words. Uh, when it comes to what's going on in Hollywood. But I'm wondering from your perspective, and then all of a sudden 
it's not over at all. The strike is ongoing. From your perspective, how well is this priced in? How much have people understood that some of these fights are entrenched and are going to lead to lower profitability in entertainment and in auto manufacturing? Unfortunately for me, I think to a certain degree, they are not fully priced in. We know that, so you look on the, on the auto side of things, there are kind of um, quite a few structural challenges to, to the sector more broadly anyway. You know, people are aware that margins tend to be very lumpy. There's not that much wiggle room in an auto margin on average anyway. Um, so there's a little bit more leeway there, um, I would say, in, in a roundabout way. When you start trying to translate this over into to media and the arts, I, I do think that there's this notion that um as you were saying that it, oh, it'll it'll get sorted it'll get done it's not going to matter but we you know we're, we're going to hear from netflix next week and this really matters for for stocks like netflix um they are nothing without their content slate um and also consumers as they're feeling that their income get eroded away and their spending power diminished we are we are pickier now about where we're throwing those dollars so for the streaming side of things i do think there's potentially room for for quite a bit of upset because actually um, if the content slate isn't perfect, we are simply just switching who we use. We've seen churn um, go on quite a, quite a wild ride um, since the pandemic for, for all of the streaming players. So that's that's definitely something I would say is, is something to be monitoring. We're all complaining about our bills, that's for sure. Sophie, thank you. Sophie Lundy hates of Heart Grease lands down. Something we do every week on this programme. The price of Hulu, the price of Peacock. <laughs> how do you feel Netflix. about that? I think what, everyone knows how I feel about not that. Not just the price, but also how you find different sports events. <laughs> you want me to go on that rant as well? <laughs> I'm kidding, Gary. I think we'll save everyone from that <laughs> okay. rant. TK's not here. Tom doesn't want to hear it either. He's listening over in Marrakesh, Morocco. Called me this morning. Did he? Safe and well. Great panel today. We'll share some of that with you. Got Anne-Marie with us all morning. Looking forward to the conversation. Amy, we need to talk about CPI and why this president even though this economy, on the surface, looking mm -hmm. at the labour market, looks OK, inflation's moving in the right direction, why that's not translating to any success whatsoever in the polls. It's not. It's a huge headache for this administration. Inflation constantly dogs them in the polls. The president continues to get poor remarks on the economy. And there was one really important poll last month that I think brought this all home. 84% in this USA Today Suffolk County um, University poll talked about the fact that it's higher grocery prices, it's higher energy prices. 84% of these people are saying it's the consumer prices going up. That is why they are not feeling that this economy is doing better, even though the president comes out every jobs day and says, look at this job market, look at where the unemployment rate is. It's not landing. Well, there's sort of this uh bizarre uh, not understanding among the economics profession. They're saying disinflation, the rate of inflation is going down. Well, still your bills are still going up. And by the way, it's exactly. disinflating from a year earlier. So it's not as if you're seeing this big drop off. Suddenly things are stabilizing in this massive way. The recent memory mm -hmm. of going to a restaurant and seeing the bill doubled. The recent re memory of going to the grocery store. Likewise, going to see your auto insurance bill go through the roof. I mean, medical insurance, all of these things. It's jarring for people whose salaries have not kept pace. Interest rates up as well. This came mm -hmm. out in a survey this week. I think this is so important. New York Fed puts out a survey of consumer expectations. Listen to these numbers. A larger percentage of consumers, 12.5% versus a little more than 11 of the previous month, expect to not be able to make minimum debt payments over the next three years. Imagine being in that position. Imagine being in that position right now. 12% of the country, 12.5% of the country worrying about not being able to make minimum payments mm -hmm. in the next three years. On top of higher consumer costs. And to Lisa's point, this is the Republican talking point. Even though the rate of inflation is slowing, the fact of the matter is what Republicans will tell you, a family on a whole is paying $700 and more on all their needs than they were prior. It's a big problem. It's a massive problem. AMH is going to be with us all morning, I'm pleased to say. Coming up a little bit later this morning, 7.30 Eastern time. So in about an hour and 15 minutes, we'll catch up with Sabat Rajapa, the head of US rate strategy over at SogGen, as we continue to beat the drum going into the CPI report. Inflation data in America a couple of hours away. Quite a move in the bond market through the week so far. Tuesday, Wednesday, what a rally we've seen on a 10-year yield. Friday, a conversation about breaking 5%. And here we are on Thursday with a yield on a 10-year at 4.56. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. We want to make it real clear, we're working on every aspect of the hostage crisis in Israel. Already we're uh, 
We're surging additional military assistance to the Israeli Defense Force, including ammunition, interceptors to replenish the Iron Dome, and we've moved the U.S. carrier fleet to the Eastern Mediterranean, and we're sending more fighter jets there in that region. And made it clear, made it clear to the Iranians, be careful. Be careful, the words of the President of the United States delivering remarks to Jewish leaders at the White House in the last 24 hours. More remarks from this administration expected in the next five minutes or so. Secretary of State Antony Blinken giving statements to the press with Prime Minister Netanyahu in Tel Aviv. Any headlines there, will bring them to you. A couple of headlines in the last 24 hours, some interesting reports. This one on the Biden administration. Amory, officials leaving open the possibility of refreezing $6 billion mm -hmm. in Iranian oil money. This has become something really contentious in the last couple of days. Oh, absolutely. And they're getting not just Republicans calling on them to do this, but also some vulnerable Democrats that are up for re-election, like Sherrod Brown from Ohio. He's the chair of the Senate Banking Committee. And he's saying anyone who supports terrorism, we do know that, that Hamas is backed by Iran, should have consequences. But you can't really unfreeze this money. It is sitting in Qatari banks. Maybe they can just make sure that Iran has no access to it. And they keep saying not a single dollar has left that account, right? And it hasn't been spent yet. Okay. That's the latest on that front. Joining us now is Norman Rule. I'm pleased to say the former senior U.S. intelligence official and senior advisor at the Transnational Threats Project at CSIS. Norman, wonderful to catch up with you again, sir. As we understand it, there has been a call between the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia and Iranian leaders. Incredibly rare Norman, what do you make of that call? Good morning. The call is rare and indeed a first between the Crown Prince and President Raisi, but it is consistent with a couple of themes. Saudi Arabia, which uh, um, uh, seeks regional stability to ensure its economic progress, also has its eyes wide open about uh, Iran. I've spoken with many Saudi leaders uh, routinely on this issue. Right now, the international community is seeking everything, every step possible to prevent an expansion of this conflict and pressure on Iran to keep its other proxies in Iraq, Yemen, and Syria from engaging in this war as well. How much, Norman, uh, given the readout and talking about how uh, they want to unite for the Palestinian aims and to really uh, avenge some of the Zionist policies, this is the language used by Saudi Arabia. I'm wondering how much there is this push-pull of the Middle East and, and some of the more moderate nations, including Qatar, including Egypt, coalescing around that message even as they seek de-escalation. That has already happened, and Saudi Arabia has been consistent in its uh, public support for the Palestinians, as well as its private deep frustration with the uh, incompetence of the Palestinian Authority and its recognition that Hamas is a terrorist organization aligned with Iran. But the reality is the Palestinian people have, in the eyes of the Saudis and many of the region, legitimate claims that must be supported. Likewise, for Saudi Arabia not to adopt this position, it would place itself at political risk of Iran, Turkey, Qatar, and other countries sort of stealing the moral high ground on an issue that is very close to the hearts of many in the Middle East. Norman, there's also reports about Hossein Amir Abdolian, Iran's foreign minister, about to make a tour throughout the region. Is that potentially behind the scenes, him also calling for de-escalation? No. Uh, Hussein Abdullahian is close to the Revolutionary Guards. His position will be uh, to encourage stronger support uh, for the Palestinians and pressure on Israel and the United States. It's likely he'll be received by all of the regional actors. He's not a major decision maker or a mover, but he'll be part of the process of de-escalation in coming days. What about Ismail Hania? This is the political leader of Hamas, who is allegedly uh, be having political housing, basically, in Qatar. Overnight, there was a number of individuals in former administrations coming out and saying that Qatar should be expelling this individual. Will Doha receive more international pressure? Almost certainly. And this is a very complicated issue. Qatar is an important and valued partner of the United States. It hosts El Udate Air Base, which is our fo central focus for air operations in the in the Persian Gulf and the Middle East. Qatar provides a lot of humanitarian support, and it has supported the administration robustly on Iran and Afghanistan. Uh, Qatar claims it does not support Hamas, but supports Gaza and uses its relationship with Hamas to uh, pass messages and de-escalate. Hamas has been present in Qatar since approximately 2006, although the relations do go back to the 1990s. 
However, it is without a doubt that Ismail Hania and other political leaders were in Qatar and likely played some role in the planning, approval, and celebration of this most heinous act. Uh, if this were 9-11 and a country were hosting Osama bin Laden, how should the world respond to that? And would we accept the statement that they're just using that relationship to play mediator? This is complicated for the administration. Norman, taking a step back, there are two questions that really need to be asked based on what you just said. Number one, do some of these calls and these negotiations move us any closer to de-escalation? And on the flip side, how much does it really signal a, a sort of percolating out of the conflict and broiling more of the region. From the first, what are the chances based on the conversations that you just talked about and the actions of de-escalation based on some of the recent phone calls and discussions? I would switch this around. Escalation is going to be a product of the drivers of the individual proxy groups in the area. Lebanese Hezbollah has taken a lot of hits in Syria and is still fighting in Syria. A war with Israel really wouldn't bring it very much and would damage its domestic position with, within Lebanon. So there will be a calculation by all the proxies that there's a sweet spot. How much can they support Hamas without being drawn into a conflict that damages their equities and while showing some loyalty to Iranian uh, pressure since Iran provides them with the money, weapons, training, and political support to maintain their positions their countries. So this is a very complicated dance, and there'll be a lot of different players in it to, again, prevent the es escalation and to prevent the destruction of these other proxies of political stature in their respective locales. Well, talking about a complicated dance, Norm, there's a headline across the terminal now that Israel says 97 people have been confirmed as taken hostage into Gaza so far. We talk about this precarious role that Qatar plays. Do you think Qatar can actually make any headway in trying to get Hamas to give back those hostages? I would suspect very much that it will try and will claim that it has some capacity to do so. The, the When you look at the 97 hostages, you want to break that down also by nationalities and think how will the various actors decide to protect their nationals? China has a hostage. You could see China going to Iran asking for its assistance. You could see a variety of countries attempting to use Egypt, Turkey, and Qatar to get hostages out. Here's your danger. Many years ago, in a different conflict, when we had American hostages with in the hands of an Iranian proxy, that eventually led to something called Iran-Contra. We're in the early days of a very complicated war, diplomatic and, and economic uh, uh, catastrophe. And we should be very humble about thinking where this might end up. But the hostage issue is going to be the most complicated diplomatic issue for the administration. So, Norman, with that in mind, what do you make of the conversations about a full ground invasion anytime soon? Well, the Israelis won't rush into this. Uh, the uh, issue with Gaza, its a, this is a small area. We're only talking about 25 by 8 miles in size, 2.3 million people, but it's labyrinthine. There are literally, in this relatively small geography, hundreds of miles of tunnels. No uh, military has undertaken military operations in an area such as this in modern times. And when they have undertaken operations, think the Russians, they usually respond by using thermobaric weapons, barrel bombs, and destroying these the, this geography. The United States and Britain came close in Iraq and Syria with areas that were one-third to one-quarter the size and buildings that were much lower to the ground. The huge civilian and military casualty likelihood for this conflict, this war, is going to be extreme on all sides, and Hamas is prepared for this. Israel will not rush into this event, but they're likely to do so after a significant air campaign, which is already ongoing. An absolute tragedy. Norman, thank you for your insight again this week. We appreciate it. Norman Rule there, the former senior U.S. intelligence official. Just to reiterate that headline, if you are just joining us, 97 people confirmed as taken hostage into Gaza so far. Still trying to get clarity, Amory, on that situation. Yeah, absolutely. And to Norm's point about how difficult Gaza is for a ground invasion, you have more than 2 million people. Well, UNICEF says that half those individuals, 1 million people, are children. Expected to hear from Secretary of State Antony Blinken giving statements to the press with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this hour. When we get some headlines from that, we'll bring it to you. Two hours away from CPI in America, going into a big bond market rally over the last couple of days. Your market looks like this right now. Equities on the S&P 500, four day winning streak, potentially making it five, up by 0.4%.
Four-day winning streak on the S&P 500 could well become five. The fate of today's trading session, arguably in the hands of the CPI report, about two hours away. The price action right now looks like this on the S&P, positive by 0.4%. On the Nasdaq, up by 0.4%. Four-day winning streak. Bramo, you've got to go back to mid-June for a run longer than that. And it all has to do with the bond market. What I find interesting is very few people are saying, this is because of fundamental strength in the underlying economy. This is purely because, hey, if you get a little bit of a, a blow-off in the top of uh, Treasury yield, well, then let's go all in because, uh, you know, earnings estimates are going up. And we've had a big move in the Treasury market. Let's talk about it. Two-year, 10-year, 30-year. Big unwind of what we've seen recently. Yields unchanged right now, but just south of 5% on a two-year. On a 10-year, we were th thinking, we had to think about 5% on a 10-year. We're back to 456. We went through 5% on a 30-year a couple of times last week, all the way back down, Lisa, to 470.68. I keep going back to the Fed speak. They said they're going to let the bond market potentially do the work for them. It stopped doing the work for them. <laughs> and then it just went haywire, right? So then how do they respond to this? The key question to me is at what point does volatility beget some sort of risk <coughs> premium that people haven't really thought about? If we have this kind of volatility in benchmark rates, that is going to be a problem for corporate financial officers who are trying to figure out how exactly and when exactly to get financing. But let's take it from the bond market to the FX market, the euro against the dollar shaping up as follows. The euro against the dollar at 106.21. That currency pair totally unchanged. Treading water going into this CPI print a little bit later. We've hardly talked about this. Need to talk about China as well. China's stepping in in the equity market over in China today. We've got this state-backed fund buying about $65 million. It's not the size, Lisa. It's the signal you send from coming into the market and buying stocks. Especially because they just also said that they were open to more stimulus. That was the story earlier this week. And it comes, did you see that hedge fund manager who was calling for Chinese officials to come step in that was basically saying, please, come on, we need you to come on and get in. At a certain point, this has been sort of one of the linchpins of the Chinese market was the reliance that market participants had that eventually they would be bailed out by the Plunge Protection Patrol. And at a certain point, if they even give a signal that they're going to act in that way, how much does that edify stocks, even just through verbal intervention? Sounds like my kind of market. <laughs> you know, run a fund, take a position. <laughs> Is that so? Dial 1-800 Plunge Protection Team. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, come in bailed out? underwater, Is not doing your, well over your plan? here. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess you're in trouble in America, Bramo. I, I know, I know. Yeah. Yep, but... Under surveillance this morning, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken landing in Tel Aviv as the death toll from the Israel-Hamas war tops 2,400. Blinken will be on the ground in Israel for less than a day, meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu before moving on to visit other nations in the region. Israel's emergency unity government still deciding whether to launch a ground invasion as tens of thousands of troops assemble at a base near the border of Gaza. AMH, this goes back to what we talked about over the last couple of days, the potential for a full ground invasion mm -hmm. at a time where we still don't have clarity on the number of hostages and from which country they're from. Yeah, exactly. To Norm's point, this is where you could see a lot of international pressure come down on Hamas or maybe on Qatar, who's trying to lead those hostage negotiations, depending on what nationalities a lot of these hostages are. Though the president did say that Americans were taken hostage. So this is of utmost importance to this White House. This is such an incredibly difficult moment for, for so many people, and it's igniting so many passions on all sides. But what you can see right now is the tragedy, the details of the tragedy that unfolded in Israel, and now uh, what some of the casualties are among civilians. And you think about just the escalation of this and that many more people dying. And it's horrific from anyone who has humanity. I mean, it is horrific to watch this unfold. The market does not have a heart. The no. market has moved on from this pretty quickly. I think the barometer for all of this, taking the temperature of this situation, is the oil market. Mm -hmm. And you saw yesterday, Anne-Marie, as soon as we got reports that perhaps Iran didn't know about this, crude starts pulling back. Right. That's the story at the moment. Right. So the oil market will definitely start to spike if Iran becomes any closer to this hostility, of course. And there's anything happens through the Strait of Hormuz, which 17 million barrels of oil go through a day. That's when the oil market will really start to pay attention. But at the moment, they're kind of shrugging it off and just keeping an eye on it. Inflation data just around a corner, two hours away. Boston Fed President Susan Collins speaking recently, saying the central bank can take more time to evaluate data because they, quote, are likely close to and possibly at the peak of this tightening cycle. The median estimate in our survey seeing a 0.3% month-on-month gain in core CPI, down from the previous read, Lisa, of 06 we, what we saw from the minutes yesterday was this sort of more two-sided risk, which we're hearing more and more about, the risk of over-tightening versus not tightening enough to curtail inflation. To me, if you start to see goods reinflation, 
does that change the conversation? Because people thought, oh, we killed that beast. We can now just work on services. But if you haven't killed the beast, then what are you doing, especially if services still are seeing that inflation? That data, that conversation just a few moments away. I want to finish on this story here. Apollo CEO Mark Rowan calling on the University of Pennsylvania alumni to hold donations until the president and chair of the board resign over concerns that the school has tolerated anti-Semitism. The university recently hosted the Palestine Rights Literature Festival, which Rowan wrote included, quote, well-known anti-Semites and fermenters of hate and racism. Lisa Penn did not immediately comment on that letter. There has been so much pressure on universities, prominent universities, uh, to come out with stronger statements than just sort of having uh, this sort of blanket. We're watching the tragedies and unfold and we're concerned and our hearts go out to everybody involved because that's basically been the party line from a lot of these universities. There's been a lot of pressure, uh, including Bill Ackman on, on Harvard. But the question here is, is there a broader discussion around taking a stand and true free thought at some of the universities that have taken lines and tried to be very cautious catering to a lot of different constituencies. Mm -hmm. Well, there was these 30 student groups at Harvard that wrote this letter saying these atrocities didn't happen in a vacuum and laid blame on Israel. And Larry Summers, the former president of, of Harvard, yeah. said he was sickened that Harvard University president, the administration at Harvard did not come out and denounce this the way they did of Putin's invasion of Ukraine, the way they did of George Floyd's death. Um, and the president spoke to this yesterday. He said it's unconscionable for people to make excuses for these atrocities. I'm going to try and catch up with Mark Rowan of Apollo potentially later this week, so hopefully we can make that happen. If you are just joining us, equities firmer here on the S&P, as they have been a week on the S&P 500 up by 0.4%. Next stop for this conversation, inflation data in America, a few hours away. Joining us now is Pooja Sriram, the US economist at Barclays. Pooja, what are you and the team looking for a little bit later? Uh, hi, thanks for having me this morning. Yeah, so I think uh, on headline, uh, we're broadly in line with consensus. We think uh, the monthly pace of inflation is likely to step down to 0.3% month over month from the solid 0.6% we saw in August. And really what that means for the annual rate of inflation is it's going to tick uh, about a tenth lower to 3.6% year over year. Uh, of course, the meat lies in uh, you know what the core inflation number is going to show us. Uh, we're, uh, we think it's going to round to a 0.3%, uh, but a slim 0.3% month over month, bringing the annual rate a touch lower to 4.1% uh, year over year. So really compared to you know, what we saw in August, uh, slight easing in price pressures, but really it's just easing on the margin that we're looking for. Is this a sustainable trend in your mind, Pooja? I'm thinking of Jim Bianco of Bianco Research that often comes on this program and says the disinflation we've seen over the last few months is transitory. Pooja, what would you say back to that? Well, I think there are parts of it that we think is, uh, you know, likely to sustain. Um, really, I think uh, the encouraging trend that we've seen is the step down in rent and OER inflation. You know, just to to give you a, a context, you know, these two categories account for about a third of, you know, uh, overall uh, CPI and about 40 percent of core CPI. So really, the fact that, you know, we've seen momentum in rent and OER inflation starting to sort of step down uh, is a very encouraging sign. And, and really, we think uh, this is something that can be sustained. We've already seen, you know, uh, data on private indicators of rents sort of normalized to those levels. And we think the BLS data is just about playing catch up to that. There's also a question, though, as uh, inflation does come down, then real wages start to pick up, especially if some of these labor negotiations are ongoing and able to uh, win over some concessions. If that's the case, what is the risk then of reacceleration if consumers have more disposable income just based on their earnings to go out and spend? Absolutely. And I think that's really the risk that uh, we've been highlighting as well, that if we need inflation to come down in a sustainable manner, uh, or really what we need alongside that is an easing in labor market conditions. And really, it's the tight labor markets that is, uh, you know, that have propped up uh, wages, nominal wages uh, that have um, also sort of created an environment where, you know, we've seen uh, a lot more bargaining power with uh, workers. So really what we need is an easing in labor market conditions. Um, you know, devoid of that, uh, it's, you know, like you said, there are risks uh, to the upside very much. So to put a bow on that, Pooja, are you basically saying that right now CPI might have less significance than labor market data, especially if uh, there is uh, no surprise in what we get at 830? Well, I, let's uh, well, let's let's not put it that way. I think uh, the the Fed is going to be extremely interested to see what the inflation data show us. 
Uh, but really, you know, the, the, the fact that they've been emphasizing on the totality of data is they're going to look at this data in conjunction with what they're seeing in the real economy side, in the labor markets. And really, you know, if they feel that a lot of the slowing that we're getting in inflation is not looking sustainable or it's materializing in categories which are known to be volatile, then, uh, yes, that's a signal that they're going to take from it. New call from City in the last 24 hours. Need to talk about it. They were looking for a hike in November. Base case now. No further Fed rate hikes. Andrew Honhorst over at City. Morgan Stanley. The last hike was in July. That was the last hike from this Federal Reserve. Pooja, do you share that view? Uh, no. Uh, we still have uh, a call for one more 25 basis point hike by the end of the year. Baseline for us is November, but really uh, I think the risks are that that could be pushed out further into the year. Uh, really, I think what has happened, like what you highlighted earlier, is you know we've seen longer term rates uh, move higher. We've seen a tightening in financial market conditions since, you know, the last FOMC meeting. Um, and, uh, you know, really, we've also heard from a lot of FOMC participants who acknowledge this tightening. Uh, and uh, some of them share the view that the Fed, the Federal Reserve can afford to sort of wait and watch uh, and see how the data evolve. But having said that, I think, uh, you know, uh, we at Barclays think that it's still a very fluid situation. We get some more data points between now and the meeting, which is in the early part of November. Uh, they're also going to be watching uh, what's happening to financial market conditions in the meantime. So really, baseline for us is still November. But there are chances that, you know, they could choose to sort of wait that one out when you should conditions evolve. When you say uh, watching financial conditions, have bond yields gone back down enough to take that extra tightening off the table for the Fed? In other words, how much do they have to fall from around that 5% level for suddenly the Fed to have to do the work and not let the bond market do it? Well, I think, you know, they've come back about halfway down to where they were a couple of weeks ago. So I think that's uh, something that they're going to be looking at. You know, we don't have a number. I don't think they have a number either. But uh, I think really the, the, the idea is to see whether this kind of a move upwards is sustainable. Uh, like you said, you know, should financial market conditions tighten in terms of longer term yields, staying higher or moving higher even further? That's really one of the key transmission channels for monetary policy. And uh, the Federal Reserve is likely to take that as a win uh, if the bond market can do some of the work for them. Pooja, thank you. Looking for one more hike from this Federal Reserve. Pooja Sriram there of Barclays. A change from Andrew Honhorst for, for a long time. It's been pushing this idea we get one more hike from this Federal Reserve. Still says there's a risk of getting it. At one of the meetings we've got left this year, November or December, but ultimately, base case now, is no change. Got some changes for you for Delta Airlines. Allow me to share with you a new range for the outlook for profits this year. The new range for full year adjusted EPS is $6 to $6.25. Previously, at least, so they had seen six to seven, so they tightened that range towards the low end of the range. Guess what the blame is? Fuel, fuel. is part of it. <laughs> fuel is part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, we are seeing fuel prices, but the interesting thing to me is the reaction in markets is on the low end, and yet expectations had already been lowered that much more based on some of the rhetoric that had been coming out because of some of the costs going up and this feeling that maybe some of these airlines can't pass along the price increases to consumers. Well, it turns out maybe they can a little bit more than they previously thought because uh, that seems to be the reaction in markets and the implication there. I'm just not buying the airfare story. Yeah. Really well, I I mean, I think, we're, no. we're told they're down, but I don't feel it at all. My take is, if it's down by $10, that means that you get $10 less of legroom, you get $10 less of breathing space, drink you have food. drink food, and otherwise, uh, you hospitality. know, options, hospitality, they Service. just are a little bit not, not nice to you. <laughs> it's talking about Delta cheaper. here. <laughs> no, I'm okay. no, 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 no. I, I will okay. not disclose what I'm talking okay, about. Okay, of course not. Okay, <laughs> all right, cool. Third quarter numbers were better than expected. Adjusted EPS came in at $2.03, the estimate one ninety four. This from the IEA this morning. AMH, the pullback reflects demand destruction. destruction. Crude. Do you realize that overnight we had a show of force too? Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman sat down with Alexander Novak for a TV interview together, side by side. The last time they did that was with me, 2018 in Oman. Going back five years. <laughs> Alan Wald of the Atlantic Council, up next. <coughs> I would say the baseline scenario is one in which uh, Israel uh, occupies Gaza, it's going to get ugly, but the conflict remains uh, contained to there. And therefore, the markets so far are essentially pricing this one as being the baseline. That's why 
oil prices have not done very much because there is not really a threat to the supply of oil in the Gulf. But the market seems to be discounting the possibility of a massive conflict throughout the Middle East for now. Seems to be what's happening over the last couple of days. That was Nouria Rabini, the chairman and CEO of Rabini Macro Associations, speaking to the brilliant Francine Lacqua at the IMF meetings in Marrakesh, Morocco. Much more through the week from Francine and from Tom Keane as well. TK on the ground in Marrakesh. We'll hear from Tom a little bit later tomorrow at the back end of this week. If you are just joining us, welcome. Looking out for CPI a little bit later. Your equity market positive by 0.4% on the S&P 500. Yields going absolutely nowhere on the 10-year, 455.63. Just like Norio said, Lisa, to some extent, this is what crude is taking the temperature of. The prospect that we get a regional more broader conflict in the Middle East. And it's not just crude, but that is definitely the linchpin that everyone keeps looking at. It's also natural gas, given what Anne Marie was talking about earlier with Qatar, their incredible role with Europe, the fact that Russia is sort of off the offline right now to a lot of the region. So you're seeing the response in that market as well. 86.75 on Brent. Bit of news to share with you this morning. Saudi Arabia's crown prince, de facto ruler, Mohammed bin Salman, discussing the war between Israel and Hamas with Iranian leaders. Adam Wall joins us now, senior fellow with the Atlantic Council and author of Saudi Inc. Adam, let's start with that call. How rare is that? This is pretty unprecedented. Uh, I can't remember the last time uh, that the the leaders, or at least the de facto leaders of these countries spoke. I do think it reflects um, the fact that um, pretty quietly, actually, this past June, the Saudi Arabia basically allowed the um, Iranians to open their embassy in Riyadh. Uh, it was kind of hidden under a bunch of other news and, and done very quietly. But uh, I do think it signaled that um, they're absolutely willing to kind of they, they kind of slowly um, pulled back from there. Uh, Iran is the you know worst enemy of the Saudi people to, hey, now we've got an embassy and uh, we're having phone calls. Um, one of the interesting things that I saw in that statement was um, the one um, calling for, uh, you know, a, a Palestinian state. And that's something that uh, basically MBS seemed to have been willing to give up on in exchange for a defense pact and uh, help with uh, obtaining a, a nuclear power from the United States. And so the question is really, is that deal completely dead now? And Ellen, this also leads to the question, was this call and the readout from it a de-escalation move or a de facto escalation in terms of a hardening of lines? Uh, I, I think I see it as, as maybe a little more on the de-escalation, just simply because uh, any kind of conversation between uh, leaders like that that didn't contain any kind of call for the destruction of all of Israel uh, is probably more on the de-escalation than the escalation. How closely are you watching not just the crude complex, but also the natural gas complex in light of uh, what we're seeing with some of the supplies being shut off in Israel with this morning's pop at natural gas prices uh, with the prospect of Qatar being involved potentially as well? Yeah, that's, I think, a, a huge issue here because uh, not only was um, one of Israel's gas fields supplying uh, regional uh, uh, players in the Middle East, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, with natural gas, but some of that gas was being liquefied and exported to Europe. So it's not just, uh, you know, the Middle East we're talking about here. Um, I think that also when you combine that with the shutdown of the Baltic pipeline, uh, that has really caused uh, European uh, natural gas prices to pop. But then... Uh, at the same time, a lot of these countries have said, hey, we're, we're, our gas stores are ready for the winter. Uh, and we've also seen a massive increase in LNG uh, shipments from the U.S. to Europe that has really helped uh, alleviate the lack of Russian natural gas. So, yes, there's cause for concern, but there are definitely other options out there. Ellen, when it comes to Iranian exports, we do know that they've been exporting more, most notably to China. Administration says that they have enough in terms of these sanctions. Uh, these sanctions. Do you think they're actually going to double down on Iranian exports? Because it seems like they're turning a blind eye at the moment. Yeah, and and that's really the big question is is how can they even double down on this? I I really think that any kind of so called doubling down or tightening of sanctions is really uh, basically saying we're not really going to do anything unless the United States is prepared to actually stop uh, Iranian tankers in the Persian Gulf or out of the Persian Gulf and uh, commandeer their oil, or they're willing to stop uh, other tankers that they suspect are carrying Iranian oil. Uh, there really isn't much teeth 
to this because sanctions enforcement all ends up on the buyer. Uh, and it can take months and months, even years to actually prosecute. So it's not really any kind of disincentive to Iran. Uh, and when China is the main buyer, and China is the main buyer of uh, Iranian oil by far right now, uh, they're, they're not really going to take uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions all that seriously unless the U.S. Uh, really goes after China in a hard way. And I just don't see that happening. So this is an enforcement issue or is this the need for fresh sanctions? I don't think you uh, what what more sanctions are they going to put that are going to actually do anything? Uh, the enforcement issue is the issue. No one should be buying Iranian oil. And yet, uh, you know, one and a half million barrels a day is going to customers, most of it China. So, uh, you know, unless they're willing to enforce it physically, uh, I'm not saying a blockade, but to actually stop the ships and, and take the oil, uh, there really isn't much teeth to this. Ellen, you've been studying the Middle East for a long time, and you've been tracking all of the conflicts that have brewed over the years. Given what we have seen in this particular conflagration of the tragedy on the ground in Israel, of the attacks in Gaza, what is your optimism that we are going to get some de-escalation and that we are going to get some sort of resolution in the near future? I'm not very optimistic. This is this is really, really bad. Um, it's I think that for Israel, it was just uh, an incredible shock to the system and they are not going to stop. I, I think it would take a, a massive, massive event to get Israel to to stop or to, you know, reach some kind of deal to deescalate. This this is not going to end. There is going to be a lot more loss of life and destruction before this is over. Secretary Blinken is right now in Tel Aviv and then he's going to go to Jordan as well. Um, obviously, what comes to mind is this potential normalization between Israel and Saudi. Ellen, are those conversations just absolutely dead end stopped? I think they're they're dead end stopped as of now. I think that Saudi Arabia's uh, kind of uh, discussions with Iran have definitely demonstrated that that's that's cooled down. Um, there's a lot of speculation that this attack was really in response to Saudi Arabia's uh, essentially saying, "Hey, we're giving up on uh, you know this Palestinian two state deal. We want." This defense pact, and we're willing to, uh, you know, recognize Israel in exchange. Uh, I, I'm not sure that that was all that likely to begin with, given the fact that while MBS may be running the show, King Solomon is the ultimate arbiter, and he's really vehemently anti-Israel. I, I really didn't think that we were going to see a Saudi recognition of Israel while he was still alive, or at least, uh, you know, technically the the king of Saudi Arabia. He'd have to abdicate or or die, I think, for that to happen. Um, so I, I'm not sure that that was totally in the cards, but I cannot see it happening now without starting a, a, a larger regional conflict. Ellen, thank you for your input this morning. Ellen Wald there at the Atlantic Council on the tension in the Middle East and the latest in the crude market. Here's the latest right now. The high of the year for Brent crude was 97.69 at the end of September. This is where we are right now, 86.63. I'll go back to the IEA monthly market report that they put out. Lisa, this quote here, supply fears gave way to deteriorating macroeconomic indicators and signs of demand destruction in the United States. Going on to say demand destruction has hit emerging markets even harder as currency effects and the removal of subsidies have amplified the rise in fuel prices. That story about foreign exchange and the commodity market is one we've been on over the last couple of weeks. And Ed Morris of Citigroup has been on this as well, that at a certain point, especially given the inflationary pressures elsewhere, people just won't use as much gas. They won't use as much uh, crude. And that is sort of what this statement seems to be suggesting, which raises two questions, which is, number one, is this basically a natural limit to where the rally can go at this point in the economic cycle? And then two, does this mean that we are going to only see higher oil prices accelerate some sort of downturn? rather than sort of be okay, be benign, be accepted in a more inflationary world. So if crude is lower because of demand destruction, is that good or bad news <laughs> for the president of the United States? Which one is it? I think it's complicated, right? Um, they obviously want energy prices lower, especially gas prices, because that is a, what many would call a tax on a consumer. But that, how does that reflect on how the economy is doing? Honestly, it's going to be they're between a rock and a hard place right now. You add the geopolitical tensions, oh. they're just going to basically say as little as possible. There's so many of these issues right now are absolutely impossible. Joining us shortly, Michael Shaw of Marketfield Asset Management, looking ahead to the inflation data in America, about 94 minutes away. CPI just around the corner. Equities higher by 0.4% on the S&P. Your 10-year yield just about unchanged for once. Your 10-year yield right now, 4 
56 from New York City. This is Bloomberg. The risk to our view is that inflationary pressures return and that can be a function of geopolitics. When things move this quickly over short periods of time, there's unrealized losses, there's potential for stress. Savings are running out combined with student loan payments coming back. All that does point to still more weakness on the consumer. You're talking about uncertainty that drives up the term premium. We're not going back to what we used to call the new normal. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Inflation data in America, 90 minutes away. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Rabbits, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this morning with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern. Your equity market on the S&P positive by a third of 1%. On the S&P 500, we have been higher, Bramo, for four consecutive sessions into this one. And we've been talking about how much of that's just been completely driven by the fact that suddenly in the bond market, you're getting a rally. And it's sort of notable to me that during these periods of time, bonds and stocks have traded in tandem completely again and again, even though people said it was going to be revenge of the 60-40. Well, guess what? Not so much unless they're both going up. And that's been the story of this year. So the Fed sounds like it's done. For now. for now. Does that change at 8.30 Eastern time? Well, we just heard from Pooja Sriram was that essentially the bond market has given up uh, some of the increase in yields or the loss in valuation that it experienced last week, which called for some of the Fed officials to come out and said, hey, bonds, you guys are doing the work for us so we can step back. Well, what if they're not doing the work anymore? Does that change the calculation? But at the end of the day, does it matter, right? Does one rate hike really matter all that much for market perception at a time where we're dealing with a million other moving pieces? It's sort of like the one thing we can kind of cling to. It's like rate hikes. Well, back in a way, seems to have contributed to a monster bond market move again in the other direction, a move of more than 20 basis points lower on a 10-year yield. We've said it a few times over the last couple of days. It's kind of like two parts Fed speak and one part risk aversion. Let's talk about a risk aversion piece. The latest on Israel, Hamas and that war, which is ongoing for another day and potentially for weeks and months still to come. Anne-Marie, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, we've been waiting for these comments from him alongside the Prime Minister of Israel, Netanyahu. What are you looking for from him today? Well, this is a very interesting moment, too, because within 24 hours, we had a huge change of Israeli government. This entire political system is very different. This is no longer very right-wing government. Benny Gantz is now in it. It's pretty remarkable to see Netanyahu and Gantz forming a government together. These individuals do not like each other, do not agree with each other. So you see Israel really rally behind the flag. Um, and Benjamin Netanyahu coming out with Blinken, I mean, this is going to be another moment, like Biden did yesterday and the previous, the day before that, shoulder to shoulder. That's going to be the remark. We stand with Tel Aviv and Jerusalem shoulder to shoulder. This comes at a time where people are wondering how far this is going to go, what uh, other nations are going to get embroiled. And that's, I think, what a lot of people are watching right now is where is uh, Tony Blinken on that? So far, it has been unmitigated support, let alone the side of whether the House can actually pass true financial support for this effort. Mm -hmm. At this point, you know, as it percolates, how far does it go with Lindsey Graham having some pretty fiery words? Is that the view of the commonplace at a time when people are hoping that this doesn't escalate into a massive conflagration? It's almost impossible to process the human tragedy that took place over the weekend and the human tragedy that we're expecting to take place in the weeks mm -hmm. and potentially months still to come. Also got to catch up with the policy. I've got no idea what's going on. You wake up to news stories, Anne-Marie, like this one that we've just had a phone call between Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and leaders out of Iran. It's pretty remarkable. You would normally not see Raisi and Mohammed bin Salman get on a phone call together. And then following this, you're going to have the Iranian foreign minister also make kind of a Gulf tour. He's going to be visiting a lot of um, these Arab nations, he's going to be visiting Lebanon. But Norman Raoul said that is certainly going to be to try to stand support for the Palestinian cause. Looking out for those comments from Secretary of State Antony Blinken at some point in the next few minutes. Let's turn to the price action. Your equity market on the S&P 500. Four days of gains could well become five. Higher here by 0.4%. Yields unchanged. They keep saying for once because this move has been monster. Monster moves, Bramo, in either direction. Last week, we were talking about yields higher, double digits, double digits, and now we're talking about yields lower. 
double digits and for once unchanged. Which raises the question of, okay, have we gotten the wash out of the technicals and actually can focus now on fundamentals? What we're watching today are the fundamentals, the hard numbers, which actually are comforting. After everything else, 8.30 a.m., we get U.S. CPI and jobless claims. We get a sense of just how much we are disinflating. Maybe people aren't feeling it in their paychecks or in certainly the grocery bills yet, but, you know, could we be coming down? Or are we going to see goods reinflation? And this really is the key for so many people. 1 p.m., U.S. Treasury is selling $20 billion of 30-year bonds. Yesterday, 30-year yields dropped the most going back to the March to SVB uh, issues. So we just we're talking about incredible volatility. How much do you throw $20 billion in and auction it off and see maybe if uh, there is this sort of less price sensitive uh, demand? And Fed speak today. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic at 1 p.m. Boston Fed President Susan Collins at 4 p.m. What could they say at this point that can really uh, move the needle at all? I'm thinking more about that bond supply. Can you imagine if that bond supply came last week? It would be a disaster. Yeah, timing was good here. <laughs> I think so too. Timing was good. 100%. A much better week for that issuance with the firming that we've seen in the bond market so far. With us around the table, I'm pleased to say, Michael Shaw, CEO of Marketfield Asset Management. Morning, Michael. Morning. I want to go back to this Jim Bianco question I asked in the last hour. I think it's worth asking of you because I know uh -huh. your answer to it. So we can have a broader conversation well, about I'm glad it. glad someone knows the answer. The <laughs> disinflation we've seen over the last few months. Is that yes. transitory? I think so, yes. Why? Well, because I, I think you had this big shock in COVID of excess demand and constricted, constricted supply, and that created a lot of, a lot of, it took a long time, but it was transitory inflation, and now you have a sort of transitory deflation. And what you see is that end demand is still there for physical goods. Uh, and you've seen PPI start to spin around back into positive territory, and I, I think CPI will follow course. Now, I would stress it's not going to be a wave anything like as powerful as what we saw in, in 21, 22, but I think it is going to stop CPI getting back into the twos and staying there. CPI is going to be sticky. Is it a mistake to sound like you might be done then at the Federal Reserve? Um, well, I mean, my view, I said it last time I was on, it's really about the long end of the curve, not the short end of the curve now. The Fed has sort of boxed itself into a corner. I don't really care if it stops at 550 or 575. Because if you look at the range of, of long-term yields, I mean, the 10-year was at 350 in May and was knocking on 5% a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I think that, that's really the question. I think the Fed has done what it's going to do in this monetary cycle. I think it's going to step away. Um, I'm of a view that at some point in time, we're not there yet, that you're going to see some form of yield curve control brought in to stabilize the bond market. Um, but that's, you know, that's not this week. That's not this Wait, month. Hold on a second. Yield curve control in the United States. Yeah. Does I, that mean that essentially they're going to hold rates high, but that they're going to accelerate quantitative easing? Like they're going to accelerate well, purchases I, I think, in the long I end? I think at the end of the day, financial stability is the unspoken mandate of the Federal Reserve. They talk a lot about unemployment and inflation. But when when things really come to a head, financial stability is, is, is number one. And we, we saw a taste of it exactly this time last year in the UK when the gilts market briefly, briefly dislocated. You know, I, I'm of the view that the Fed um, doesn't really have things under control. It's certainly not in control of the fiscal policy of this country. The fiscal policy of this country is, is reckless in the extreme. Um, and, uh, you know, I think at some point in the foreseeable future, you're going to have disorder at the long end of the curve. And I think that's going to be important enough that it, it becomes something the Federal Reserve get, get, gets involved in. So is that kind of what equity buyers are banking on? That essentially when they say, when they come out and they say, stocks can handle bonds where they are, yields where they are. Are they basically saying, because if they get out of control, the Fed's going to step in regardless of what's going on with inflation? No, I think they're just not thinking about it. I, I, think, I, mean, I think that, that people spend an awful lot of time worrying about monetary policy over the short term. And, and the, the Fed feeds into this. They're constantly out there talking and, and like sort of hinting, maybe we'll do this, maybe, maybe, may, maybe we'll do that. And, and the sort of general sense the Federal Reserve wants to get out there is that it is somehow in control of things that it's palpably not in control of. I mean, I'd argue it's had no effect on inflation. It's, it's totally lucky that inflation went away. It didn't go away because of what the Fed did. It went away in spite of what the Fed did. Supply side rebalancing? Is yes, that what, what's happened? Absolutely. Yes. Do you think that won't be sufficient then to get inflation down anymore? Have we seen the bulk of that? Um, I, think we've seen, I think we've seen the bulk of it. Now, the long end of the curve may have its own form of discipline. You know, I've said, I've said before that, the, 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 you know, effectively nothing that happened from last October to, last, to, to this August really got transmitted to the long end of the curve. You know, that's no longer true. 
We, we've now transmitted another 75 to 100 basis points of tightening to the long end of the curve. The question is, is really what happens next? Typically, those sell-offs can become self-limiting because ultimately you start to worry about a slowdown and people yes, buy treasuries absolutely. again. What I hear from you is that you think the budget deficit is a financial stability risk that this I Fed's do. going to have to respond to. Now, if that's the case, let's run with that. Mm -hmm. Where does that leave the dollar? Um, the question is whether this is unique to the United States or whether it's, uh, or whether it's something, of a global, something of a global malaise. If it's, if it's unique to the United States, the dollar gets significantly weaker. If there's a host of, of G7 countries which are running similar deficits and have forced down similar paths, then it's a hard asset story. If this is the case, then do you foresee a certain level, a certain trigger for the Fed to step in and be able to justify additional purchases at a time where inflation yeah. is still expected to be hot? I don't think it's a, there's a magical yield number. I don't think 5% or 525 in the 10 year suddenly gets the Fed jumping up and down. It's more the orderly functioning of markets. You can have a very orderly market with a 10 year at 5%. You could have a very disorderly market at, with, a, with the 10 year at 5%. I mean, I think the quality of, of auctions, I think the amount of bids that they get, I think the aftermarket response post auctions matters a great deal. Uh, you know, it wasn't that the yield in the UK was so high this time last year, but it was clearly a disorderly market. There was clearly massive force selling at the, in the institutional community. And that's when a central bank wakes up extremely quickly. And fiscal policy risk was at the epicenter of that as well. Let's finish here. I can hear people screaming at home, listen to this. Do I buy stocks or sell them? What do I do oh, if all uh, this yeah, happens? I think in the short term, you know, for, I think there's an investable market rebound here. And, and uh, I still think there's portions of the equity market that are, that are doing OK. Is Washington listening, AMH, to this? Uh, well, the, a lot of people are, but doesn't mean they're going to react on it. The privilege of acting recklessly just seems to have been lost. This is the whole thing Moody's is talking about. It's the idea of governance that is not going in the direction that it should, that is concerning them. Yeah, but if any of these officials are looking to the stock market for any validation of their concern, we hear all of these incredibly doomy and gloomy prognostications, and then <laughs> investor after investor says, but actually this makes stocks a pretty good buy for now. Just process that. Budget deficit is a financial stability risk that this Fed has to respond to and commence yield curve control. And if it's unique to America, can you imagine the dollar weakness? We're going to see off the back of that. If we, remember what happened right. to Sterling right. off the back of that story. What happens to the US dollar if that starts to materialize? The key thing you said, if, right? But sure, what we've seen, if, sure. and it's a global issue. And what did we hear from Tony Dwyer? That basically, battery, uh, higher rates are bad because this is an entire world leveraged that it, to low rates. And it is not just a US-centric issue. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. The S&P 500 here firmer by 0.4%. In the bond market, some calm, stability, 456. Michael Shell, that's not the calm you expect to stay, I imagine. Is this the base case for you now? Yeah, I think at some point, it, I, don't know, I don't think it's going to happen this year, but I think at some point we are going to have, you know, we're going to have a period of, of, of real instability and that, and that some of the sort of long-term funding that people have taken for granted. I, I look at something like the municipal world. I, I, I don't see how they manage themselves through the next two to three years. Wow. These are huge calls, Michael. I mean, it is and it isn't. The world will go on. <laughs> It'll just be, there'll be, but there'll, there'll, be, there'll be ways of operating that became normal over the last 15 years that won't be possible over the next 15 years. If you're just happen. joining us and you missed some of this, we'll make sure we post the full interview on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. Michael Schaub, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thought-provoking stuff, really. Michael Schaub of Marketfield Asset Management. Just an update on a news conference that we've been waiting for over the last hour or so. Secretary Blinken, alongside the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, that news conference beginning in Tel Aviv, Amory, right now. Yes, yeah, certainly is. He's there, what he calls to bring a message to say that the U.S. has Israel's back. Um, a pretty significant moment, especially given Israel has a complete shakeup of their government yesterday. Yeah, to that point, Netanyahu has not been the most popular president. A lot of people are not happy with his regime in any way, shape, or form. At the same time, the feeling of anger is overriding that, the feeling of, of need to... Uh, protect the nation. Much more on that news conference in just a moment. Joining us shortly, Henrietta Trey's of Vader Partners. On the way forward, the prospect of escalatory moves abroad and the dysfunction here at home. From New York City, good morning.
also come before you as a husband and father of young children. It's impossible for me to look at the photos of families killed, such as the mother, father, and three small children murdered as they sheltered in their home in kibbutz near Oz, and not think of my own children. Absolutely brutal. Over the weekend, you're looking at live pictures right now, hearing from U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken giving statements to the press with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Just a really, really difficult moment, Bramo, over in the Middle East. The images and the stories are tragic, and anyone who is watching and hearing about any, everything that's going on has got to be deeply moved. It is hard every day to come in and say, well, what's the price of money? And yet that is our job. Uh, but really, everyone's thoughts and, and feelings right now are uh, with what's going on over there. This is a, a huge show of support that the United States is making just days after this, sending Secretary Blinken over there, having this meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, which has had a very fraught relationship with this administration as well. Well, and this just goes on to what Biden said yesterday. Biden came out yesterday and said this is a campaign of cruelty. And also that he said it was unconscionable, some of the reaction by individuals around the world to justify this massacre by Hamas over the weekend. Just unbelievable. Tragic scenes in the Middle East over the weekend. Much more on that news conference with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken giving statements to the press. That news conference ongoing alongside the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. Your market at the moment, if you are just joining us, welcome. Looks like this going into CPI a little bit later this morning. One hour and about 13 minutes away. Equities are higher by four-tenths of 1% on the S&P. The bond market yields going absolutely nowhere. 4.56 on a US 10-year at the moment. Bramo, likewise in the FX market, the euro doing nothing at all. 106.18. Doing nothing after incredible volatility, as we've been talking about earlier. And it raises this question, has this all just been positioning or has this been something fundamental? The reaction in markets to CPI that we get in about an hour and 12 minutes will be very interesting, John. Joining us now ahead of all of that is Henrietta Trace, the Director of Economic Policy Research at Vader Partners. Henrietta, welcome back to the program. Let's not start with the escalation potentially abroad. Let's talk about the dysfunction at home. Are we getting a speaker anytime soon? That's a great question. Um, our problems certainly seem trite and petty compared to the atrocities in Israel. But um, I do think that the adage in D.C. that you never waste a crisis is something that is bearing out. Um, the speaker's election was something that when we went into this, we were predicting, you know, could be days, if not weeks long. Um, so I don't think anybody should be particularly overwhelmed by the idea that Steve Scalise, the Republican from Louisiana, didn't immediately uh, have a kumbaya moment on the House floor yesterday. So they are trying. Um, it's my opinion that Scalise will be the next speaker. It may take through the weekend. The House is on alert that votes could happen at any time. Um, there is going to be some messy drama. That's what you get when politicians become celebrities. And that's sort of where we are right now. But I am hoping that the whip operation in Scalise's office has been around for a decade. Um, they will unite with Jordan and some of the McCarthy team behind him and be the only candidate capable of getting 217. I'm personally overjoyed that it became evident quickly that Jim Jordan did not have the votes. That has always been the case. It was the case in January. It's the case today. So the faster they move on from Jordan is a good sign. Now we're just sort of going through the growing pains of accepting Scalise. But he can only afford to lose four votes on the floor. And the, quote, never Scalise camp is well over a dozen. How does he shore up all of those votes? Ironically, through the exact same strategy that Kevin McCarthy deployed back in January, you've got a horse trade now. This is what members are supposed to do for their home districts. Twist arms, hold out your vote uh, for as long as possible. I do think that the war in Israel is helpful in making these uh, petty issues look small. Uh, there is a robust effort to pass legislation condemning Hamas. Uh, Minority Leader McCarthy, uh, McConnell has a bill on the Senate side that he's working on with bipartisan support and at least eight Democrats to otherwise condemn the attacks in Israel. They want to pass legislation. So when you're holding out for a small rules change in conference, you look like a look like you're holding up progress and not being an ally to one of the most important nations that President Biden is actively being overt about supporting. Um, so I do think that the um, atrocities in Israel, if there is any silver lining, it's that it squeezes House Republicans and those 12 never releasers to uh, get in line. What happens when they go to the floor? Do they 
are they able to deal with their problems behind closed doors so it's a clean vote on the floor? Are we going to see a repeat of multiple rounds like we did in January with Speaker McCarthy? Honestly, I think it's just must-see theater. I, you, you'd, you'd be wasting an opportunity to make a spectacle of yourself, and I don't think bank on that. I think if anything, for the last 10 months, House Republicans have shown us that that's what they enjoy. Uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't start off by predicting a smooth sailing for Scalise here. Henrietta, it feels like a tenuous moment on many levels. There are two fronts uh, that the U.S. is getting actively involved in. It's Ukraine as well as in Israel. I'm curious about whether Democrats are going to try to strike any deals with potential leaders and come in to fortify this and make this less of a House battle uh, within the Republican Party. I have been waiting for that kind of uh, momentum all year. I am, as a former Senate staffer, shocked at how behind the scenes or even absent the Senate has been. Um, helpfully, M Majority Leader Schumer did cancel his trip to Asia or cut it short and is coming back now. I'm optimistic that he and McConnell will become more of a presence in D.C. It's time for the Senate to step in. The House is constantly in disarray. We had a very strong leader uh, in, in past decades, and now we do not. And that is just really bearing out right now. We need leadership from the Senate to come in, put their foot down, sort of be the grown-ups in the room and say it's time to get to work. Um, we have probably another week of this dysfunction. Be mindful that the Senate is not in session right now, so there is no adult in the room. And the <laughs> charade that the House Republicans are going through right now could maybe last another two weeks. But after that, the war in Ukraine, border security, aid to Taiwan, aid to Israel is, become, is going to become something that cannot be avoided. And they're going to pay a political price for not acting. And I think they're going to want to act, which will force them to choose a speaker. So in other words, you don't necessarily foresee a November 17th shutdown just simply because there is such a level of urgency and a level of uh, heightened importance at, at right now that there will be enough, to use your words, adults in the room. You know, this is a nuanced dynamic. I think with 80 percent odds, there will be a partial shutdown. Um, things like the Department of Labor, where we get our economic data from, may well be shut down into November 18th. But I do think that the crisis in Israel and the crisis in Ukraine, the issues of Taiwan and the border crisis create enough political momentum to pass at least one, maybe even three appropriations bills. And by the way, I think that's what people are pretty annoyed at Scalise about is saying the quiet part out loud. We need a defense appropriations bill. That's eight hundred and sixty billion dollars. We need a state and foreign operations bill because there are foreign operations that need to be funded. Um, and the least we can do is couple those with aid to Israel, aid to Ukraine, border security funding and Taiwan. That is a bill that I think can pass. And I place 60 percent odds on it, which is probably optimistic. But, you know, been there before. And that's that's how I operate. So I, I'm at 60 percent. We get a partial shutdown. Um, and that is pretty optimistic, probably, versus expectations. That's the domestic story. Let's finish on the international one. Something really delicate. Henry, this administration wants to project support and strength. As Anne-Marie suggested, standing shoulder to shoulder with the Israeli government and the Israeli people. We're talking about one of the most densely populated areas on the planet. Israel is talking about wiping out Hamas after the massacre that took place over the weekend. Inevitably, we're going to see significant loss of civilian life in the days and weeks to come. How durable would that support be for the Israeli government? Uh, the Israeli government, I think, is acting in a way by combining forces, as y'all were talking about moments ago, that is unprecedented. And at the moment, what you're seeing is a tremendous amount of diplomacy that in these early stages is really wrapping its arms around Israel. And I think President Biden has been clear about this. It's designed to create this aura of extraordinary support, whatever you need while we're in the early throes of this, so that in the future, in the days and weeks to come, you're able to exercise restraint and say, hey, maybe this is a bit too far. Maybe we can find an alternate avenue. This is kind of along the lines of what we saw in Ukraine, not to you know, make them complete parallels, but this, uh, the, the, the way you create alternative off ramps via sanctions, via um, different kinds of munitions and military advancements. I think those are things that by embracing Israel now so close to the chest, the way the Biden administration is doing, yeah. especially in contrast to a Trump uh, candidate who's saying, you know, maybe they didn't do the right thing here. Um, I, th I think that's really going to pay dividends in the future. Henrietta, thank you. Henrietta Trace there, Aveda Partners. Much more still ahead.
just 60 minutes away from the CPI report in the United States of America. The market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, firmer by a third of 1%, up by a third of 1% also on the Nasdaq 100. Four days of gains on the S&P coming into Thursday, potentially making it five. The fate of this equity market today, at least, potentially in the hands of the CPI report, just around the corner. In a bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, what a move we've seen over the last week or so. Pushing through 5% briefly a couple of times last week, breached that level, then moved to the downside broke it again. 471.73 on a 30-year this morning. Yields creeping higher by a couple of basis points, Lisa, but it's the last two days. Yields aggressively lower at the long end of the curve. And why? Is it because of Fed officials saying that they might be done? Is it because uh, there has been maybe some sense that we're reaching some peak, or is this basically some positioning washout, and now we can have a cleaner read to the CPI print? I think that the way that the market has moved is actually very interesting, because if we climb back to those highs with the CPI report, we can get a sense of just how vulnerable positioning is right now. Morgan Stanley, Seth Carpenter at the weekend, July. The Fed was done in July. That was the last hike. Andrew Honhorst over at City, Lisa, that is new. He thinks they're done too. He was surprised by the idea that they see the bond market doing the work for them. He was surprised at some of the tone that's come out of recent Fed officials in light of the sell-off that we've seen in Treasuries before the past couple of days. I should just make that clarification. So at a certain point, and we keep talking about this. When does that take away the restraint that the Fed officials are kind of banking on for the bond market to do for them? Let's turn from the bond market to foreign exchange. I can confirm that TK is chasing down President Lagarde in Marrakesh, Morocco, to try and catch up with the ECB president a little bit later this week. <laughs> the euro, 106.19. We are totally unchanged on the euro against the dollar. After reclaiming 106 in the last few days, after having a little look at 104 in a previous few weeks, Let's get to the latest this morning. Under surveillance, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken giving a news conference with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu just moments ago. Blinken saying at least 25 American citizens were killed in the Hamas attacks. Later today, Blinken will meet with President Herzog and other leaders in the region. The push for diplomacy comes as humanitarian supplies and power are cut off to Gaza. The Israeli Energy Minister vowing to continue the siege until hostages taken by Hamas released. So that's an update, Anne-Marie, to the number we got yesterday, and that number yeah. is still climbing. It is rising. 25 now. It was 22 in terms of those Americans that have been killed. Um, but there's also Americans that have been taken hostage, and that's what makes this possibility for ground invasion of Gaza so difficult. And Blinken also talking about the precaution that is needed right now to harming civilians. There's two million people in this very dense, small strip in Gaza. And how do they isolate uh, Hamas and Hamas leaders when they have been talking about using people as human shields? When they talk about hiding in schools, in hospitals, and other places, this becomes a perilous moment on both sides. But what you are seeing for the civilians I'm talking about, uh, what you are seeing is the U.S. making a massive show of support. And yesterday, Joe Biden incredibly fired up after uh, talking about some of the intelligence that they've seen. After a tragic loss of life, and that tragic loss of life continues. The latest here down in Washington, here in the United States. Congressman Steve Scalise emerging as the Republican pick to become the next Speaker of the House. Scalise still has to win the full vote. He can't afford to lose more than four GOP votes to win against unified Democrats. It's unclear when the key vote will take place after the unprecedented ouster of Congressman Kevin McCarthy just last week. I saw some pictures yesterday. I'm sure you saw them as well. McCarthy still has his office, right? So yeah, he's Speaker of the House with Kevin McCarthy. I thought he took down the sign, but I think I he's still I saw the sign, using... I saw some pictures. Yeah, it's sort of a feeling that he's kind of still hanging in the wings. Well, he did tell his colleagues, do not nominate me, but he's probably playing chess. That a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. I think, I think it's a game of chess if everyone's trying to play <laughs> checkers. Don't it? nominate me, but please do. It probably is one of the worst jobs to have in Washington. And although it was nice to see that Henrietta thinks that this might be... Um, you know, come to an end with You're Steve not so Scalise. Sure. I'm not so sure. You had last night George Santos of <laughs> New York. He tweeted, I am a never Scalise. He has not reached okay. out to me. No, but no, okay. but the issue is whether or not what you think about these individual players, the issue is he can afford to lose four. And the backroom dealing, there's actually more delegates that vote behind closed doors than on the floor because you have U.S. territories like Puerto Rico, like Guam. It's going to be very difficult for him to get to 217. I was shocked Santos was still around when I saw the latest story. Well, he still uh, going. He has a number. He has a number. He has a number. Genuinely surprised. Whatever you have to say about his indictments and the legal peril he is in at the moment, he has a vote on the House floor. 
and there are individuals like him that are quote never Scalise. This is going to be very challenging. I don't, I don't, I don't see how this gets wrapped up never quickly. Never Scalise. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? It I means sort we're of never going to vote for him. Never Trump. But what does Never Scalise mean? Where does that come from? They're not going to vote for him. But as Chip Roy says, Americans every day are seeing the sausage being made. I'm just upset that they're not bringing the cameras back on the House floor so we can see really the conversations up close and personal. Just one comment. This isn't a sausage being made. This is a sausage <laughs> being dissected and then distributed around the room and then basically dissected once more again. It's pretty A bolognese ugly. then. It's, it's pretty <laughs> ugly. Let's get to the final story. UAW ramping up pressure on Ford. Nearly 9,000 workers walking out of a highly profitable truck factory in Kentucky on Wednesday. The surprise move takes aim directly at higher-priced F-Series pickup trucks and large SUVs. The strike between auto workers and the big three car makers began nearly a month ago. This was kind of like the card in the back pocket, Bramo. Mm. They're pulling out that card. And they're pulling it out not on a Friday at noon, which I thought was interesting. This always has been Sean Fain's playbook, is that he comes out at 10 a.m. On, uh, on Fridays, and he says, OK, I'm going to have a Facebook Live press conference, and I'm going to tell you all the things you've done wrong and what we're going to do next. And this time, it came early, which raises a question, are we getting closer to the end? Is this because they want to exact some sort of uh, specific concessions at this point? Or is this something that is far more damaging than a lot of people previously thought? It sounds like the latter and not the former. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we were getting closer to an agreement, would you pull that card? They've got to be running out of money at the UAW in right. order to provide the workers. This is sort of the, uh, explosive, the, new, the, the explosive option for them to go to. Why take it out now if you're still building? That's a story for a little bit later this morning. Joining us now, Sabadra Japa, head of U.S. rate strategy at SOCGEN. Sabadra, great to catch up with you. Inflation data about an hour away. What are you and the team looking for? So we're looking for a 0.3 on, on a headline and 0.2 on core. Um, you know, it could be 2.3s, which is the consensus. It's, it's really a lot of uncertainty around rents. We saw, uh, you know, rents uh, kind of moderate quite meaningfully. And, we're, you know, our, our expectations that rents will continue to moderate. But if we don't see that and we see a reversal, then that could be that could take us to point three. Um, but broadly speaking, I think that the, the concern right now for uh, the markets is around the uh, the, you know, how the Fed is going to respond uh, on, on a more broader uh, circumstance of, uh, you know, higher long end yields is the Fed done uh, hiking rates. And the question really for the markets is how long they keep rates high for longer. Subhadra, what do you make of the whipsaw action that we've seen over the past week? You know, it's really hard to know exactly, uh, you know, how the positioning was. I thought that a lot of the positioning had gotten cleaned out in the in the in the very sharp sell off we saw. Um, you know, geopolitics is always quite tricky, um, and unfortunately, even though uh, the situation in the Middle East is is very volatile, the market has gotten used to looking past events like these, and the reaction is is perhaps going to be moderate. So, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if ten-year yields stay between four and a quarter and 4.75 percent uh, until we get some sort of a clarity on the situation in the Middle East. But broadly speaking, we see fair value in 10 yields around four and a quarter percent. So, um, you know, the sort of run up we saw up to 475, 480 uh, to us, I would say about, you know, 50 percent of that is probably more technical than fundamental. So put that together, Subhadra, if that's more technical and it's going to play down back to that four and a quarter percent yield on the 10 year, does that basically put the Fed back on the table and not necessarily see the bond market is doing the work for them? That's a very good question, Lisa, because in some respects, you know, we've been talking about this for a year or so, is that we've, we've said that the that front end uh, monetary policy is very blunt and the monetary policy transmission mechanism is broken in this cycle. So the rise in the long end yields, if anything, was doing the Fed's job uh, by tightening financial conditions, by raising mortgage rates and corporate borrowing costs were going higher. So in some respects, if, if long end yields do come back down towards 4%, then you're going to see a reversal of that trend and the Fed having to kind of switch gears back to suggesting perhaps tighter policy, perhaps even delivering another hike if the data continues to remain strong. So it's this sort of very tough balancing act. And that's why you heard from the Fed saying that risks uh, from here on are a little bit more balanced on the policy front. So, Badger, help me with this. Work with me. Do we have a better understanding of why yields were higher based on why they're lower? 
uh, not really. I mean, I think that, you know, over the longer run, the way I look at the market is based on fair value, perhaps some some technicals that are going to be driving yields uh, higher. We saw a variety of technicals that drove, uh, you know, re- yields higher. We had, um, you know, unwind of positions, uh, you know, as well as uh, some technical reasons in the very long end in the futures market that drove uh, long end yields a lot higher than people would have anticipated. Um, so we're trying to see if we can kind of establish a new range between five and a four and a quarter and four seventy five, uh, and that's kind of where I see yields staying for at least the remainder of the year. Next year it's a different situation because I think if the data starts to to turn, I think you're going to see the trend towards lower yields in 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 the early part of next year and to uh, and towards perhaps the middle of next year when we're expecting the US economy to go into a recession. So, Subhantra, with that in mind, just to put a bow on it, do you think it's fair to say that what we've seen over the previous few days is more of a positioning story that's built up over the previous few months? It feels that way to me. Um, I mean, I don't see really any big fundamental drivers. I mean, term premium has risen quite dramatically. Uh, People point to the supply picture being very skewed uh, relative to demand. I would agree with that argument. Uh, but ultimately, I think with the with the U.S. and Treasuries, uh, Treasuries are a safe haven asset, and Treasuries are going to trade much more in line with fundamentals over time. You might this might be the beginning of a secular bear market. It's really hard for me to know, but I think you're going to see a lot of bull spurts in the bond market before we kind of embark on that secular bear market over the next several years. Sabadra, thank you. Sabadra Rajapa there of Sogjen, the latest on the bond market. Your bond market this morning shaping up as follows. Your 10-year yield, 4.56. We had a blowout jobs report. As far as I'm aware, we're still trying to work out what yield curve control is in Japan. China's still stepping back. What changed in the last couple of days? Well, obviously, you need to buy bonds. I mean, honestly, there's no real answer to this except for a positioning kind of uh, story because otherwise, or maybe you could say it's a risk aversion uh, with respect to geopolitics. But as we've heard from person after person, you're not really seeing that meaningfully in other asset classes, maybe in oil a little bit, but not enough to justify this type of move. CPI just around the corner. If you aren't just joining us, welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 on a four-day winning streak, potentially making it five. The S&P this morning positive by 0.5. 4%. Counting you down to CPI a little bit later this morning, coming up at 8.30 Eastern time. As soon as that number drops, Mike McKee is going to break it down. Then we'll hear from Jay Bryson, the chief economist at Wells Fargo, reacting to the CPI data. Bramo, just around the corner. I'm really most curious about the market response. I mean, yes, the actual numbers are going to be interesting, but uh, there was a period of time when we saw that incredible run up in yields, down in price, where every upside surprise, hotter than expected print, would lead to a massive move in markets. Has positioning washed out enough to not have that type of reaction will be a real tell. We ignored PPI, didn't we? We did completely. (laughs) Why was that? I have no clue. Basically, people saying it's not as relevant. It's unclear whether those prices get passed into consumer prices. They're not necessarily that tied to what we see in CPI. It befuddled me that it was completely ignored because it was hotter than expected. Michael Shaw of Market Field earlier this hour said the disinflation was transitory. Yes. The disinflation we've seen is transitory. You'd love that. He's not alone, by the way. I've heard the same thing from Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Mike Contopoulos of RB Advisors was talking about the same thing as well. Doesn't get it. Sees the economic data turning up. Haven't mentioned Neil Dutta for the best part of two days. So Neil Dutta <laughs> of Renner. There you go. Ding, Neil ding, often ding. writes in and talks about the same thing. This is exactly what he's looking at too. And yesterday in PPI, you got confirmation of the nodes of that. Basically this idea that you got goods reinflation and the signs of it in this data. If that's the case, doesn't that really confirm this transitory inflation story? Uh, this tra- transitory, excuse me, transitory disinflation. disinflation. That's right. Sorry, That's it's, right. you know, I thought like we stopped tech. using the word transitory. No. Get a lot we of people in trouble. Transitory for a different no, it's not dynamic convenient. now, AMH. Anne-Marie, have you heard about Azempic and fuel costs? I and have. how much you can save on United? The author of that particular report from Jeffries joining us next from New York City. Equities up by a third of 1%. Inflation data in the next hour. In my view, this transition to a more patient approach, taking the time to holistically assess incoming information, was warranted for a number of reasons. In particular, it reflects the fact that we're likely very near and perhaps at the peak for this tightening cycle. With the risk of inflation remaining persistently high, more closely balanced 
with the risk of slowing activity more than needed to achieve price stability. Aren't we there yet? Apparently we might be. Boston Fed President Susan Collins speaking at an event at Wellesley College on the path forward for the Federal Reserve. Perhaps they are done. Andrew Hollenhorst, the city, thinks they are. Inflation data just around a corner. Coming into it, we look like this in the equity market on the S&P 500. Equity futures higher by 0.4%. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, 4.55%. 84. Much more on that story in just a moment. Just an update on the airlines. We had Delta Airlines coming out with earnings a little bit earlier this morning. A beat for 3Q. 4Q just tightening the range towards the low end. The stock likes what it hears, though. We're up by 2.8%. An update on what's happening in the Middle East. BA Flight 165 was on its final descent into Tel Aviv's airport when it decided to turn around yesterday. A company spokesperson said the pilot didn't feel safe enough to land as there were sirens going off. So we've got airlines including American Airlines, Delta, Lufthansa, Air France, all suspending flights in the last couple of days, Amory to Israel. Also Emirates this morning, they're canceling flights to and from Tel Aviv until at least October 20th, last flight departing from Dubai on Thursday. Um, this is something. I know a lot of people that are actually trying to catch flights, a lot of journalists, to Israel, and it's just not possible at this moment. The only ones that really are operating on a predictable level are El Al, and they are taking a lot of conscripts back to the Army. And for the first time in 41 years, El Al is going to fly on a Saturday, because they don't normally fly on wow. a Saturday, to bring back uh, people who are heading to fight in the Israeli Army. Let's continue this conversation. Joining us now is Sheila Kayalu, the Senior Equity Research Analyst over at Jefferies. Sheila, let's start with this story. Just how distressed disruptive is this for the airlines currently? It, it, it's disruptive, but it's manageable. What we've seen from Delta Airlines is they've cut their capacity to Israel through October, but I'm sure we'll see that change and schedules uh, be trimmed into the rest of Q4 and potentially into January, depending on how long the conflict lasts. But it's manageable from a risk profile perspective that it's 1.5% of capacity for Delta so not a needle mover, um, and that traffic might get rerouted to other European cities. So uh, obviously a very sad situation, what's going on there. And LL is the carrier that is flying because they do have some ISR equipment on their aircraft. So um, for Delta, it's a financially manageable situation. There is a question, though, uh, about larger risk aversion to travel. There have been other conferences that have been canceled or postponed in Qatar and other places uh, in response to potential violence and just disruption in the region. Is there a sense that this could make any kind of dent in uh, some of the revenues or just the appetite to travel at a time of uh, incredible unease? I think it might pull back international traffic a little bit, but we, you know, we seasonally expect that Q2 and Q3 are the biggest transatlantic uh, Mideast travel season. So we'll see a pull back into that in Q4. Um, so the airlines already have that built into their capacity plans. Um, and again, that travel might get rerouted to that's holiday travel and leisure travel might get rerouted to other cities. Um, in terms of corporate, uh, more U.S. focused, Delta did see a 10-point improvement this quarter. That was the first time they noted that. Um, corporate's kind of been stuck at 80% recovered. That's mostly in the U.S. I'm talking. But, um, you know, we did see some improvement to going back to work. So um, not sure how much corporate international travel uh, it, to the Mideast and that region uh, Delta has specifically, but we do think it'll be a manageable risk for, for U.S. network carriers in general. The Delta results actually put to rest some of the biggest fears, at least for now, that higher oil prices would seriously impede profits. It also raises questions about how much uh, they are unable to pass along some of those price increases to the consumers. What did you learn in terms of the reality on the ground of how airlines are managing some of their fixed costs and their ability to actually keep uh, airfares elevated? So I think, um, you know, my thought into today was Delta's print was going to be in line and it's in line and that they were going to narrow to cut the guidance slightly and they did. Um, but I think as we have other network carriers and especially the low cost carriers report through earnings season, this Delta print is going to come out looking much better. Um, you know, Delta did go to the low end of its guidance, but one of the factors to highlight here is they generated $2.7 billion of free cash flow year to date. And they're they're, they narrowed their guidance to $2 billion of cash from $3 billion prior. That's due to higher maintenance and fuel. Um, so, you know, I think we're seeing the impact of that. Delta does have a long-term target of, uh, you know, billions of dollars of cash generation out there. So 
um, we, we could see those trimmed because of what's going on with higher fuel prices and uh, maintenance expenses also coming in higher too. How much more difficult is it going to be for these airlines to hedge for potential future spikes in jet fuel as they see this tragedy unfold in the Middle East? None of the airlines outside of Southwest currently have a massive hedging program, uh, so they do it through other ways. Uh, for instance, for Delta, we, we'd highlight that 55% of their revenues are from other services, such as their Delta Tech Ops network, which is a quite a unique feature they have um, that's differentiated and helps lower their maintenance costs. They have their low loyalty program with Amex as well. Um, so they have other revenue streams. They really derive revenues from premium uh, customers uh, so they try to hedge it in that way rather than a direct hedge. Can we finish there just on those loyalty programs? Changes over at Delta, Sheila. How are those changes working out? I say I wish I could use a, a Sky Miles Club because I never have time. I'm constantly running around. Um, you know, and Ed Bastion is kind of taking a step back and saying he'll revisit the exact changes because of the feedback they've gotten. But it's just making it more difficult to to earn those points given that they have such a high loyal uh, customer base uh, because they they do have a very reliable on-time network and part of that comes from their other revenue streams too. I'm trying to work out if they're going to lose customers because of the changes they've made. Do you think they might? I don't think so just because they'll <laughs> they'll actually get me to where I need to go so it's okay for me but <laughs> You know, and, and they have such a loyal customer base. I mean, that's what's resulting in the, these changes to begin with, is that they have too many loyal customers, so they're just making the tiers uh, slightly more difficult. So I don't, I don't think they'll lose customers. Perhaps you, you might, you know, swap a Delta and United, but you're not going to move to a different tier. My colleague Tom Keane would say, right now we need the Bramo cam, <laughs> because Lisa has views on this, Sheila. Well, I just Big think, views. Hold on a second. First of all, this isn't people necessarily being loyal. It's people who get an American Express card. So if you get an American Express mm -hmm. card, and then you get into the lounge, and then the people who actually are flying don't access it unless they spend about a million dollars in actual <laughs> ticket costs, then you have to wonder, why should someone stick with one airline rather than go to any airline that offers them the best fare that gets them to where they need to go? Um, I think also one thing to remember, which we haven't talked about because there be, there's been so many fears of airline profitability with fuel going higher, is capacity is still tight in the market um, to certain to certain city pairs, right? So it's not like you have tons of options. You, you usually have one to two to pick from. So um, that's why airlines have been so successful gaining pricing so far, um, especially we're seeing that in the international areas. Um, so. Yeah, I think, I think that's where they're stepping back because they don't want to lose that customer base to that other carrier potentially, but I don't think you're going to see a massive shift. So basically, they don't have to worry about losing that customer based on what I just heard, Sheila. Sheila Kaihalu there of Jeffries on the latest with Delta. If you want to get into the lounge, good luck to you. You need like hours just to line up. <laughs> it's true. Just to get in. Especially if I you, see that yeah. line to the Sky Lounge. I feel sorry for everyone flying with Delta. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you. you. stop no way. trolling me? If First I do of all, fly with Delta, yes. which is rare, if I do <laughs> and rare. I see that line, I never Never get in that line. I never go in that lounge. I'll just find a local cafe somewhere in the terminal. I got to be honest. Down. Moving back That's to the down. U.S. the last two years, I am unimpressed with the lounges in America, there the we go. service in America. The lounges oh, abroad boy. are much better. Okay. That's why I re remain a gold member at British Airways. But compare, even that's going. Compare and contrast the lounge at Heathrow the shopping available mm. at Heathrow. It's very nice. To JFK. And the standards are so low here, you get excited about LaGuardia because they've got <laughs> okay. a new restaurant. Okay, LaGuardia is <laughs> actually amazing. very nice. It's they have no, really nice. LaGuardia oh, is nice on. relative to yes. well, the alternatives. That's what's so funny. Or relative new, to where it was. I mean, LaGuardia and everyone's okay. like, oh, LaGuardia's amazing. <laughs> For somebody who didn't know what LaGuardia was, you went there and you felt like you might be going to Port Authority in 1989. My father refuses to pick me up if I land in LaGuardia, JFK, sure. But LaGuardia, he's like, absolutely not. I'm not going there. Even now? Even now. It's take better a cab. now. No, it's better take a now. Cab. It's beautiful. When, when they were building it out, it was ridiculous. You used to have to take a bus, oh, yeah. a coach to get a taxi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was ridiculous. That, that was... But there's no, like, there's infrastructure around airports in other cities the way the U.S. completely lacks. You can land in Heathrow. You can get land at Express Heathrow into Paddington. and be in central London in 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. That does not exist in New York City. You can be in central London from JFK in an hour and 20 minutes in rush hour traffic. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's great to get to Manhattan from JFK. Mm. Oksana Aronoff is going to join us shortly from JP Morgan. That conversation just around the corner. Equities on the S&P, positive by 0.4%. CPI data, inflation in America in the next hour.
whether it unravels or whether the momentum in the economy changes, that could be equivalent to another rate hike. I actually don't think we need to increase rates anymore. Current policy is restrictive and putting downward pressure on the inflation rate. That's really what my concern is. We're likely very near and perhaps at the peak for this tightening cycle. Maybe we can get inflation all the way back down and avoiding a deep recession. That's what I would call a soft landing. So far, it's looking more favorable. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Just getting tons of messages now about <laughs> airport lounges. Alitalia Rome. I'm with you, Alitalia Rome. From New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together this morning with Bloomberg's Amory Hordern, TK in Marrakesh, Morocco. This hour, all about inflation. The data 29 minutes away. Coming into it, the price action looks like this, up four tenths of 1% on the S&P. Lisa, CPI just around the corner. And how much is this market going to swing on an upside surprise? That really, to me, is the key. Where is the bias at a time where people are saying it's not one inflation print, it's a slew of them. And the one that we got yesterday was hotter than expected. And no one seemed to care. So go figure exactly how this is going to be and responded the bond to. market rally continued. Exactly. <laughs> Big move on Tuesday. Big move on Wednesday. Lisa, you slower. And this is sort of raising the question, and you asked it very well. Do we have any sense of uh, what drove yields higher based on what drove them lower? You said that, and it was a great question. And the answer, I think, very clearly is absolutely not, except maybe it is a positioning squeeze. And if that's the case, what information are we gleaning from a bond market that the Fed is saying is doing the work for them? It's a big, big data point for Wall Street. Amory, it's a big, big data point for the president of the United States. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, this administration continues to get poor remarks when it comes to the economy. Poll after poll shows that. And then when you dig in some of these numbers, it's about higher gas prices. It's about higher food prices. That is their main concern. Even though they'll come out and they'll, and they'll tout a very hot labor market, people are just not feeling it when they're paying higher for their consumer goods. That's the main domestic concern for the economy. Let's talk about their concerns for what's happening internationally right now in the Middle East, in Tel Aviv. Secretary Blinken alongside Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the last hour the death toll, Amory, just keeps on climbing. It still feels like days later we don't have clarity on those key issues. There's a lot of fog right now and there's a lot of questions being asked and we don't have full clarity. But right now we do know that Secretary Blinken, who is standing alongside Benjamin Netanyahu, giving the full throttle support of the United States, but he did say that that death toll now is at 25 American citizens. Uh, this is weighing heavily on this White House. The death tolls are going to be rising pretty dramatically in the upcoming days if some of the rhetoric is any guide to go by. And there's a question here uh, for markets, which tend to be cold hearted and try to look past what they don't understand. There is a question, at what point are they forced to pay much, much more attention if there is some sort of escalation? And we've heard that escalation type of rhetoric come out of a lot of different places. So people are watching this closely, sort of saying, can't really care about it yet, but there just is a question, okay, well, at some point it might make more of a difference. The Israel-Hamas war in its sixth day. If you aren't just joining us, welcome. We're counting down to the inflation report in about 27 minutes' time. The market's shaping up as follows on the S&P 500. Equities firmer, higher by a third of 1%. Four-day winning streak on the S&P coming into Thursday, potentially to make it five, would be the longest winning streak going back to the middle of June. In the bond market, big moves, yields lower. 455.84 after threatening to go up into the 490s and beyond on Friday. Lisa off the back of a blowout jobs report just on Friday. And still, we started the week talking all about the bad things that have been happening in the world over the weekend for obvious reasons. And it meant we didn't talk about a payroll report that came out on Friday. And maybe it obscured that and forced more of the flight to safety. At the same time, if you have a better than expected jobs report, if you have what we're experiencing yesterday with PPI coming in stronger than expected goods reinflation beginning yet again, all of a sudden, can the narrative switch on a dime, considering the fact that people have been sort of jumpy with their positioning and jumpy with their sense of the longer term paradigm? The two years still in and around 5%, 499. With us to discuss, Oksana Aronoff, the head of market strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. Oksana, good morning. Good morning. You wanted high yields, you got them. Were they high <laughs> enough? <laughs> Um, I do find it fascinating, John, as you just mentioned, that on Friday we were pushing 490 on the 10-year. What has happened since then? We've had a monster beat on jobs. We had better than expected PPI. We had weak Treasury auctions. And yet today we are, for the past couple of days, we're seeing this rally, although nothing really changed. In fact, if you look at this latest you know, move at the long end that, it's got, that has been sort of relent relentlessly higher until the last couple of days, 
What has happened? The Fed only hiked 25 basis points since May, only once, and yet we've seen this monster move at the long end. So, Lisa, to answer your question, what is really driving that? It's really a lot of technicals. It's really the fact that we have this tremendous fiscal deficit spending that we're trying to finance at a time when the Fed is selling, our largest foreign holders are selling, banks are not adding to their treasury holdings, and so all of those things are continuing to create pressure at the long end, along with the fact that we don't have a AAA rating anymore, right? And there's a lot of kind of other things at play. And depending on how the data will move, and we are seeing sort of a bit of a reinflationary trend here with the PPI, yes, that can absolutely snap this rally back. So does that make you like bonds here or not? To John's point, is this enough? Um, no, it's not enough yet. In fact, I think the 10-year, even at some of its highest points in the 4.8s, was still very much priced for a 2% inflation world. Because remember, the 10-year ultimately has to reflect growth plus inflation plus a long-term premium. And if we just go by growth plus inflation, we are not um, on the 10-year where we should be, just based on that you know, very basic math. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if the 10-year does cross 5%. Without a doubt, the geopolitical events that are unfolding, um, to the extent that they engulf you know, additional players and, and other countries, can um, change the rhetoric, no question about it. But if we kind of focus on what's happening in the U.S. and the U.S. rates as a reflection of the economic underpinnings, the technical underpinnings, we are not yet at fair value on the 10-year. There's been a sense in markets that the recent test of 5% yields on the long end seems to only edify a sense that the risk asset market is solid and can withstand some sort of higher rate regime. Do you agree with that? I mean, is that basically what we have learned, that if you get stability at 5%, Everything can go along, everything can be copacetic. That's certainly kind of what we've seen, right? Spreads have stayed tight. In fact, spreads have tightened since the events, right, in the Middle East, which is really interesting, and, and stock markets are um, actually higher. But I do think that the passage of time with this higher cost of capital will absolutely take its toll on corporate balance sheets. You know, we are seeing a default cycle that is underway. Defaults in the high yield space have tripled since the beginning of this year, albeit from incredibly low levels. So we started at 1%. We're now pushing 3% on defaults. And that drumbeat is going to continue because without a doubt, there were a lot of companies that probably should have never made it past 2020, but did, and that are going to have their, you know, come to Jesus moment, let's call it. Call it. So I think when it comes to corporate balance sheets, to some extent consumer balance sheets, because we are also seeing cracks in the lower income consumer just hasn't made its way to say the top 50%. And until it does, I think this market is underestimating or your typical bond investor is underestimating the strength of the consumer. But without a doubt, there are some trends underway there um, to the extent that commercial real estate will continue to grapple with issues and, and reprice. Any sector of this market that depends on cheap financing is going to struggle as we continue to live in the higher uh, in this higher cost of capital world. And that will happen with or without a recession. I think that's really important to recognize. Whether we go into a recessionary backdrop or not, um, there's going to be a repricing in credit. The time in this stuff is difficult, obviously, but we do have some information on the maturity profile of all these companies. What's the window for that? So in the high yield space, because that is, of course, sort of always the canary in the gold mine, this is where defaults tend to be concentrated. We do have a uh, kind of a spike in maturities in 2025, another one in 2026. So as we go through the next six, eight months, and, you know, as you said, timing is difficult. These things can, we never know what the tipping point will be. And when it happens in retrospect, it's sort of like, well, of course, you know, that's that's what caused it. So it could happen in a month. It could happen in, in three or six. But as we go through the next six, eight, 12 months, um, we're going to see that repricing underway. I'm going to do that really irritating thing that journalists do. I'll ask for a time and a price. So that was the time. Give it a price. Right now, spreads are like 400 basis points. It's not that wide on a historical basis at all. What kind of spread widening are you and the team expecting? Yeah, so just to give you an idea, you know, the long-term average spread in junk rated debt is above 500. So we are not even fair value at this point. The long-term, you know, recession average is above 900. So if you do believe in a recessionary backdrop, then you shouldn't really be in these markets period. That's not enough compensation. You have double Bs out there, which is the highest tier of the junk rated space that are paying you, you know, six plus percent and in a world where cash is almost paying you that much. So I think because investors are seeing these generally higher yields, John, as you said, you know, eight, nine percent in high yield, for example, it's like, oh, this is this is attractive, but they're not recognizing that the actual compensation for the risk they're taking on in that name, in that sector is really, really minuscule. We were talking with Michael Shaul earlier this morning of Marketfield. 
and he was saying that we're going to possibly get some sort of yield curve control should there be some disruption in markets in a more significant way. And a kind of repricing that is disorderly could spur that. Do you buy into that idea? I think any yield curve control, you know, I don't know whether we will be in a world where it's implemented here in the U.S., but I think it would be a complete failure because it does not, absolutely does not address the inflationary underpinnings. You cannot sort of control what's going on in the economy by putting an artificial cap. And I think if central banks have learned anything over the last 12 months is that meddling in bond markets and artificially manipulating essentially yields and badly, generally. Um, I would also say that, you know, to the extent that a slowdown is in the cards, because um, certainly this kind of soft landing has dominated the conversation, and it seems to be kind of where we're headed now. But soft landing in itself is not a destination, right? Because you're always trending. You're accelerating or decelerating. And we do agree that generally, at this higher cost of capital, the trend will be a decelerating one, eventually. We think it will come later than most expect. But where we disagree is that we think that the Fed is going to be a very muted player whenever that deceleration in the economy does arrive. Uh, with inflation above their target, their hands are going to be very much tied and they will not be able to deliver the very aggressive cuts that I think investors associate with any kind of slowdown. And I think looking back to like the late 90s is an instructive period in our history to see that where inflation was kind of around that 3% mark, a little bit higher, and the Fed kept the Fed funds rate 45 to 6% in spite of the fact that we had the Asia crisis, Russian crisis, LTCM, right? All these bad things were happening, but the Fed funds rate stayed elevated because inflation. It's an interesting point. If you are just joining us, a lot to get through this morning. Inflation data just around the corner. Welcome to the program. Your S&P 500 is firmer here by 0.4%. Your bond market yields lower a single basis point of 454.81. The inflation data is about 20 minutes away. The latest on the Israel-Hamas war entering day six. We had a very rare call take place a little bit earlier on today between the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Iranian leadership. And now, Anne-Marie, we hear from the Iranian foreign minister. Yeah, Hossein Amir Dolian, he's talking about this act of resistance was entirely Palestinian. What you're going to see from this individual, he's doing really a regional tour upcoming. He's going to go to a lot of Gulf states. Anyone, any Gulf states that are going to be in conversation with Israel, he's going to make them feel very uncomfortable about this moment. And Iran is going to be strictly behind the Palestinian cause. But more importantly, Iran is the main funder and backer of Hamas. There is no Hamas in terms of how they get their weapons, how they manufacture all this stuff, how do they train these militants without Iran. But the fact that they are blaming it entirely on the Palestinians and saying and continuing to say that they were not involved in the orchestration of the attack and the planning of the details, and the fact that early reports in the New York Times coming out with this reporting yesterday, uh, that they were surprised by the timing of the attack, which is the reason why there has been a, a bit of resistance to really pinning it entirely on them. Is this sort of them leaning into that? It's a question we've asked over the last few days. Is this a distinction without a difference? What's the official response to that question from this administration? It's a great question. This administration has to walk a very fine line between wanting to implicate Tehran directly and not. But they cannot go out and say Iran is off the hook. Iran fully backs Hamas. It's why they're able to exist. And that's the latest from Iran this morning. Oksana, thank you. It's good to see you. It's been too long. Don't be a stranger. Oksana Aronoff of JP Morgan Asset Management. Thank you. Your equity market positive. Inflation data, 20 minutes away. We've deployed the world's largest aircraft carrier to the eastern Mediterranean. We bolstered the presence of U.S. fighter aircraft in the region. We're providing other support as well. We continue working closely with Israel to secure the release of the men, women, children, elderly people taken hostage by Hamas. We're pursuing intensive diplomacy throughout the region to prevent the conflict from spreading. That's the latest from the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking alongside Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Tel Aviv. Joining us now is Elliot Ackerman, the former White House Fellow and U.S. Marine Corps veteran. Elliot, always wonderful to catch up with you, sir, under difficult circumstances, I know, this time around. Elliot, we've talked a lot in the last week or so about a key distinction 
the fact that Hamas is financed by Iran, but Iran supposedly, according to many reports, was unaware of the attacks that took place over the weekend beforehand. Ali, is that a distinction without a difference from your perspective? No, I think the uh, the distinction certainly matters. Um, this isn't to say that you know Iran is not complicit in this, and it's not to say that uh, the international community shouldn't be paying attention and dealing with the Iranian relationship with Hamas. Uh, but the fact that Iran is trumpeting the, trumpeting the notion that they were not directly involved in the planning of this attack, to me, the way I, I interpret that is that they also do not want to see a uh, a, a wider spread of this conflict into the region. And I think that is an important distinction. Isn't this how Iran, Elliot, protects, ex protects itself on the international stage to make sure they continue s to sell their oil to places like China, that they just fund their proxy groups around the region, but then are able to say, well, we didn't know about it? Absolutely. And um, that is their MO. Uh, it's how they operate. Um, but, uh, you know, this is obviously a moment where emotions are running hot and, uh, you know, leaders in Israel and leaders in our own country need to make very clear headed decisions. And there are two different questions. There's the question of what to do about Gaza and what to do about Hamas. Uh, and then there's the question that's really a global question of what to do about the Iranian regime that sponsors terrorism. And I think it's important to keep those two distinct, because if they are conflated, you run a much higher risk of this conflict spreading outside of the borders of Israel and Gaza and becoming a regional conflict. Um, you know, because this is happening at a moment, too, where we ha are seeing in places like Ukraine this sort of rise of an authoritarian axis that includes Iran, Russia and China. Mm -hmm. um, overnight, there was a rare phone call between Mohammed bin Sa Salman and Ibrahim Raisi, uh, the Iranian leader. Do you think the United States pressured the Saudis to tell the Iranians to stay out of this, as well as make sure the proxy group Hezbollah in Lebanon stay out of this as well? Um, that's clearly the message that the, the U.S. is sending, I mean, to include the, the deployment of the, the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier to the Mediterranean. So I think that call is a positive uh, development. I think any time you have a crisis like this, the uh, the more communication that you're seeing between sides uh, is only a, a tool to de-escalate the crisis. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that as a development. Ali, I still don't think we know or appreciate how bad things could be in the coming days and weeks. There is talk of a potential full ground invasion, Elliot, on one of the most densely populated parts of the planet, anywhere in the world. You've got that first-hand experience of the type of urban combat that might be coming. Elliot, can you describe for our audience what we could see play out in the coming weeks and months? Yeah, you know, I, I uh, fought in the Fallujah battle in Iraq in 2004, and that was uh, house to house, very intense urban combat. It, it went on for, for months, and I think that's what we're going to see uh, going on in Gaza. And um, uh, those images are going to be very, very disturbing, and there's going to be a lot of suffering. Uh, the Palestinian people are going to suffer. The Israelis are going to continue to suffer. Um, and that is also going to change and challenge the, the political calculus. Um, so in the, in the weeks and months ahead, uh, I think everyone should be bracing themselves for, for that type of violence um, and trying to also keep this conflict from spreading in the region. That's going to be very difficult to do. With the potential reality of what you're describing here, Elliot, describe the potential shifts in the political calculus. How durable is the support of international allies for the Israeli government, given what you expect to play out? Well, I think that, uh, you know, from this moment forward, as, these, as their offensive begins, you know, support typically starts to erode. So for the Israelis, it's, it's critically important that uh, whatever they're going to do with regards to Hamas, it get, it, it get done expeditiously um, and that they continue to the best of their ability to maintain the high ground by at all times respecting the laws of warfare, reducing collateral damage and civilian casualties uh, as much as is possible. But those, are, those are very difficult things to do and the type of house to house, block by block, urban fighting, that the Israelis are going to see in Gaza. And a group like Hamas is going to want to put Israeli soldiers in positions where there are civilians in harm's way. They're going to want to create these images that will erode international support. So there are, there are tough days ahead in this conflict. 
And uh, we're all bracing for that. Elliot, I'm curious what you're watching to understand the escalation. We've heard reports about potential uh, missiles being bomb, uh, being uh, lobbed over the northern border of Israel with respect to Syria, with respect to Jordan. How much uh, are you seeing signs of escalation there versus largely this conflict being contained to the Gaza region? Well, I think what you just what you just indicated are the types of signs that I'm watching. You know, for instance, the, uh, the the clashes that were occurring on the northern border with uh, with Hezbollah are obviously you know concerning. We want to watch those. I think the positive developments that we have seen uh, have been how vocally and clearly the Iranian regime is saying they had no part in planning this. Uh, I think that's a positive development. I think the uh, the dialogue between the Iranians and the Saudis is a positive development. So, you know, right now, this is all about nations and groups sending one another signals. Um, and it's important to also keep in mind that, uh, you know, the groups like Hezbollah, Hamas, and nations like Iran are not a monolith. Uh, they will sometimes act in ways that are contradictory to one another. Um, so, you know, again, these are very fraught days that we're heading into. Um, and uh, those are some of the, the signals that I uh, am, am watching uh, as I try to make sense of this myself. Hezbollah is said to have thousands upon thousands of missiles. How much can the Iron Dome sustain? I think we've seen the limitations of the Iron Dome. Um, and, you know, there isn't one technology that is going to completely secure a nation. I'm, you know, security comes by putting together different technologies and techniques into an integrated type of defense. Uh, but I think what we have seen in this attack is that certain Israeli and international preconceptions of, you know, what would result in security uh, were, were, were proven wanting. And so there is a significant reevaluation of Israel's security that's going on right now. Um, and that's going to continue long after this war is over. We do know that the U.S. is already sending over more interceptors for the Iron Dome. But how quickly does Congress need to act to make sure that they can continue to fulfill those requests? Well, we're sending over more interceptors to the Iron Dome. The Israelis are also able to go into their stores to replenish those. And so, I mean, in some ways, this is analogous to Ukraine. It, it's, uh, it's more that you need to replenish the back end to make sure that the, uh, the type of supply that we're looking to provide both in Israel and in a place like Ukraine uh, is sustainable. And so, you know, in recent years, we've seen sort of the U.S. Uh, military industrial base uh, challenged in, in ways that it hasn't been uh, you know, for, for, for decades. And so um, the, can, this only solidifies the importance of reinforcing uh, our military industrial uh, production facilities in the U.S., which, which we're already doing. Elliot, as always, thank you for your service, sir, and thank you for being with us, and hopefully we can do this again soon. Elliot Ackerman there, the Marine Corps veteran, former White House fellow and co-author of 2034, a novel for the next world war. Just a gruesome reminder, Anne-Marie, of what we might have to potentially look at in the days and weeks to come. Yeah, and to his point, yesterday the president did come out and say that he did have this conversation with Benjamin Netanyahu to make sure that they are abiding by rules of war. And Blinken almost reiterated that again today, the precautions that are needed when you're dealing with a place like Gaza, how dense it is, and how half the population is basically children. And when you have leaders who uh, have a history of hiding behind civilians, in order to uh, have some of the images that are going to be coming out, uh, that also makes things that much more catastrophic. Without a doubt, without a doubt. That's the story at the moment, the state of play between Israel and Hamas. Coming up next, we turn to the financial markets and the economic data, CPI, just around the corner. This is going to be a breakdown of the next five or ten minutes or so. Mike McKee is going to break down that economic data for you. We'll catch up with Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo to give you the analysis. That analysis is just around the corner. CPI, up next. Inflation data in America just seconds away. The CPI report just around a corner. The market price action going into it looks like this on the S&P 500. Equities elevated by 0.4%. Yields are a little bit lower, down by four basis points going into the print. 452.97, a whole lot lower over the last couple of days. The inflation report in America with Bloomberg's Mike McKee around a table here in New York drops right now. Morning, Mike. 
Good morning, guys. Well, the numbers come in a little bit hotter than anticipated with CPI up four tenths. The forecast was for a three tenths increase, but that's down from six tenths to the months before. The core comes in up three tenths, which is bang on. And so year over year, CPI 3.7% unchanged from where it was in August. And the core 4.1%, that's down two ticks from 4.3% in August. So some relatively good news there. We'll take a look at uh, what the uh, numbers uh, break down to. But first, uh, let me pass along the jobless claims are still confounding 209,000 uh, on the week. Uh, that is not what was expected by analysts who were looking at these uh, auto workers strikes and thinking that some people might be off work. 1,702,000 for the overall number of uh, continuing claims. That's up from 1672. So more people on uh, the jobless rolls, staying on the jobless rolls, but neither one moves significantly. So at this point, uh, this is kind of uh, I would say Fed friendly, but doesn't beat you over the head kind of day in terms of what you think they're going to do. It's a slight upside surprise on the headline number. It wakes up the bond market at the front end of the curve. So let's break up the bond market. Two year, 10 year, 30 year. Two year yield is higher by seven basis points. What's below 5% now north of 5% at 5.05% on a two year. Seen some big moves on a 10 year at the long end of the curve over the last couple of days. Yields lower by more than 20 basis points in two sessions. Yields just with a little bit of a lift and the early part of the reaction to this story uh, by four basis points to let's call it 460 on a 10 year. So yields higher. Let's look at FX, the euro against the dollar. It looks like this at the moment. The euro at the moment negative against the dollar. Had to reclaim 106. So break back down to 105 at 105.90. Yields up dollar stronger. I'll finish on the equity market about 60 minutes out from the opening bell. Equities roll over as well. We were positive by about 0.4 percent, now up by not even 0.2. So, Bramo, you've got to think about where we have been over the last couple of days and what we've been doing coming into this. The smallest of upside surprises on the headline number, just enough to wake up the front end of the curve again. To wake it up, I think you're, uh, the way that you're phrasing this is absolutely correct. I'm actually surprised it's not a bigger reaction because last week, if we had gotten any kind of upside surprise, that would have been a huge increase that we would have seen in yields. This week, not so much. Is there a signal from that? Have we blown out some of the leverage positioning or something like that? Really, right now, the biggest move that I'm seeing is really on the currency space, which is interesting after all the uh, drama that we've been seeing in yield space. So, Mike McKee, PPI, upside surprise, CPI, the smallest of upside surprises. Put it all together. What do you make of it? Well, the interesting thing about the uh, number, the, uh, uh, the upside surprise in the headline number is that much of it is energy and much of that was gasoline up 2.1 percent, breaking a kind of string of lower numbers. But the 2.1 percent, half what we saw for PPI. And the rest is in housing. And that was kind of perhaps one of the disappointing aspects of this. Uh, shelter up six tenths after being up uh, just three tenths in August and uh, owner's equivalent rent up six-tenths after a four-tenths gain. So we had been anticipating that housing would start to push down on inflation. It contributes to overall inflation for this month, so not a particularly good news. Used cars fall, uh, no surprise there. And uh, we're looking at uh, food and beverages up a, a, a tick, not a whole lot. Apparel falls. and. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, used cars fall and airline fares down, uh, or rather, up three tenths. So, kind of some of the usual wait, wait, wait. suspects. Up. You said up, right? I said up. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's well, be honest. That's, that's believable. That's yes, because that's Tom, went, Tom went on assignment and they saw him coming and they just <laughs> raised the price of tickets. <laughs> well, I just want to say this quickly. Maybe this is sort of the reason for the muted reaction in uh, in the bond space, particularly on the long end. I'm curious whether basically what you're saying is the uh, most elements are decelerating accelerating when it comes to inflationary pressures and those that aren't are uh, just sort of lagging behind. There is a feeling that this is a disinflationary <laughs> report. Uh, it's kind of a disinflationary report. Uh, it's a little bit stronger um, than perhaps was anticipated. There were some thought that we might see a, a real downside surprise to the core, but that didn't happen. So, uh, you know, you take your where you take what you can get when you can get it. But I don't think this moves the needle for the Fed at all. Uh, they are watching the data, and now there are a lot of other things out there geopolitically they got to keep an eye on. Uh, let me just uh, look quickly here at uh, jobless claims. No real uh, information in there about the UAW strike. Um, 
we don't see Calif uh, Michigan. Well, Michigan goes up 400 uh, jobless additional jobless claims. Not a not a big one. Uh, and uh, Indiana up 300, but Ohio's down 1500. So some of the areas where the strikes are underway, n we're not seeing people file. So amazing. Uh, the, the, I think it was Chris Waller said yesterday it was an abs it's an absolutely amazing labor market. Yeah. 209,000 see jobless claims still close to 200k. Mike McKee, thank you. Let's talk about what we just got. Headline inflation just slightly hotter than expected, 0.4% month over month. The expectation in our survey 0.3, previous read 0.6. Look at core, strip out energy and food, all the stuff that you like to use. Eat, heat your houses with. Strip that out. 0 0.3. You know where I'm going with that. 0 0.3. The median estimate in our survey, 0 0.3. So in line. So the smallest of upside surprises. Enough to wake up the front end of the bond market. Yields up by seven basis points on a two-year. 5.06% on a two-year yield. Up four basis points on a 10-year after dropping more than 20 over the previous two sessions. We're back to about 460. Off the back of that, dollar stronger, euro weaker. Lower now on the session on that currency pair, 105.80. We had reclaimed 106 very briefly. That currency pair is negative a third of 1%. And going into the open and bound, the S&P 500 just about positive by 0.1%. On the open, in about 30 minutes from now, we'll catch up with Greg Peters of PGM on the bond market. We'll speak to Sarah Malik all about the equity market over at Nuveen, Troy Gajewski of FS Investments, and then pushing ahead to tomorrow, barely talked about it today, Lisa, looking ahead to this one with Eric Nigerian of UBS on the bank earnings coming up tomorrow morning. I know that. I forgot. I was thinking when you said that. JP Morgan tomorrow. You know, and I remember that, but it just seems so off the radar. Uh, there is this question of whether this is enough of a disinflationary uh, effect to really give people confidence that inflation and the disinflation that we're seeing now is more than just transitory J. Bryce and over at Wells Fargo, chief economist there joining us now. Uh, what's your thought just now to start with, Jay, on what we just saw in the CPI print that did come in just a bit hotter than expected? Yeah, Lisa, I mean, I'll, I'll use a phrase here that I think John is probably familiar with that, you know, this was kind of a damp squib. Um, it's kind of, uh, right? I mean, I don't think it's going to change anybody's view of what's going on in the economy. I don't think it changes anyone's view, um, you know, at the Federal Reserve uh, about this. Um, I think it, you know, maybe in general, it kind of keeps them in play. It keeps the possibility of another rate hike, uh, probably not at November, maybe December uh, live. But in general, it, it's, it's kind of what I, I think most of us kind of assumed was, was going to happen. Damp squib. I actually had to look it up. It means an event that is not as exciting or popular as people thought it would be. I'm curious, though, Jay, the fact that we got an upside surprise with PPI yesterday and the smallest of upside surprises on CPI now. Are you surprised we're not seeing more of a reaction in markets that have been responding to winds blowing in another room over the past couple of days? Well, you know, we, as you know, we had just a tremendous backup in yields over the last few weeks here. And so, uh, you know, I think the market is just trying to find this equilibrium right now. And, you know, again, I don't think this was big enough to really change sentiment all that much. You know, if we, you know, if we would have printed you know, another 0.6 on the headline and a 0.4 on the core, then I could see much more of a, of a, a market reaction here. But just given all the price action we've seen over the last two weeks, if in some sense, it's not all that surprising to me. We haven't seen a bigger reaction this morning to this, this data. What it does highlight, though, is something that you and uh, Sarah House have been speaking about for quite a while, which is the final mile and how difficult it is to get inflation back down to 2%. How much does this edify just how difficult that battle is, given the fact that we're seeing signs that goods inflation is starting to reignite. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, for us, it you know, boils down to services, right? Services represent more than 60% of the overall CPI. I mean, I don't know what, the, you know, the, the so-called super core was. This is services x housing. Uh, but that's been running, you know, we're, we've been getting 0.4 sort of numbers on that. And so that last mile to get us back down to 2% on a sustained basis, uh, you know, that, that's, that's tough. And that's why the Fed is probably going to re remain restrictive you know, for quite some time to make sure that that does come down. And so what you have to do is you have to have, and they, they said this in the minutes, uh, the FOMC minutes the other day, you have to have subtrend growth for a while to, uh, to, to bring that down to 2%. And I'm, I'm afraid that's what we're going to be looking at over the next few quarters is kind of subtrend economic growth. The report also talks about the increase in the gasoline index as a major contributor to the rise. How difficult does the current geopolitical environment make the fact that uh, this gasoline index potentially has the potential to continue to rise, to make this 2% even that much harder? 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And if you look at, you know, if you look what's happened since, uh, let's call it late September or so, gasoline prices have actually come down pretty significantly, like, on the, you know, 15, 20 cents a gallon or something like that. You know, what's going on right now in the Middle East will probably stop that, uh, that, um, that decline right there. And if, if things obviously heat up over in the Middle East and you start talking about, you know, potentially Iran going offline in terms of, uh, you know, pumping 3 million or so barrels a day, then that's obviously going to put upward pressure on, on oil prices, and that would arrest that downward um, trend that we've seen at least in the last two weeks in terms of gasoline prices. Do you start to consider that and put that into how you're thinking about the next year or so? So I, I guess what I would, the way I would characterize that to our inflation forecast is it's an upside risk. I mean, at this point, just given how fluid that situation in the Middle East is, I don't know if we would necessarily try to factor that in right now. And so, you know, we would come up with some sort of point estimate in terms of our, our view in terms of inflation over the coming, uh, you know, year or so. Uh, and we would say, well, maybe the risks are, are a little bit skewed to the upside here. Um, and, and so we'll just have to keep an eye on what's going on over there. Uh, but keep in mind that gasoline itself <coughs> represents a pretty small part of the, of the CPI. I think it's only like 6% uh, or something like that. It's pretty small. And so you'd have to have see a you know, pretty significant increase in gasoline prices that was sustained to have a, you know, a lasting impact on the overall rate of inflation. Jay Bryson of Wells Fargo, thank you so much for being with us. If you are just joining us, we did get uh, CPI data that came in just a touch hotter than expected, and it was mostly driven by the non-core, or but the overall, including energy and food prices coming in, uh, with a year-over-year -year at 3.7% versus a headline number expectation of 3.6%. I do want to note that we are seeing a little bit more of a pop in the 10-year yields now up uh, close to about four basis points, uh, five basis points now 4.61 percent if you are just joining the program s p futures now basically flat at 44 10. michael mckee uh, here alongside myself as well as Anne marie hordern and mike i just want to get your sense as you dig through some of the details are you finding anything else to give a sense of just uh, what the underlying trends are that could indicate whether this disinflation is just transitory well the underlying trend is very good on the super core that jay mentioned we have it up just uh seven basis points during the month of uh of uh, September. And so that suggests that we're still seeing progress coming down, although we did see shelter costs go up a little bit during the month. So you take that out and services prices are definitely disinflating on a three month basis, 1.14%. So we're looking at uh, progress uh, uh, underneath everything else at this point. So that in, in itself is good news. It's interesting to see what happens with shelter, though, because that expectation had been it would start to decline. And obviously, we've seen house prices go up since uh, there's no inventory on the market. Right. And that may be putting pressure the other direction. And I did see a story, and Marie, I don't know if you saw this, about how New York rents are starting to soften. They're actually coming down. Although, you know, any hope that they're going to go to an affordable price kind of dampened by the analysts coming I out. I didn't see this, but it is contrary to what people tell me about what it is like to live in New York. When I told them what my rent was in D.C., they were absolutely shocked. They were, they were saying um, they But to this down. point, the report says that Shelter was the largest contributor, accounting for over half the increases. This is a, is a major problem as people deal with higher food prices, higher energy prices, now higher housing costs. Yeah, coming up, we're going to parse through exactly how to respond uh, and how the market is responding in all of these ways, as well as uh, what to expect coming up with bank earnings. David Kelly joining us of J.P. Morgan Asset Management. In markets, you do see a bit of a sell-off reprising itself over in the bond market. Stocks basically doing nothing after getting a slightly hotter than expected CPI report. We are very closely monitoring how the situation evolves. It is too early to say. Uh, we have seen some up and down on, of oil prices. We have seen some uh, reaction on markets. Very clearly, this is a new cloud on not the sunniest horizon for the world economy. That was Kristalina Georgieva, IMF Managing Director over uh, in uh, Marrakesh, where she is alongside the World Bank as well as the International Monetary Fund at their annual meeting. Tom Keane will be there. We will be catching up with him tomorrow when he does host an awesome panel, and I'm sure he will be trying to catch up with a whole host of uh, luminaries that are over there. John's gone off 
to prep for the nine. I am here alongside Emery Hardern. We are so glad to have you on a day uh, which is really pocked with the uncertainty that Kristalina Georgieva was talking about with the backdrop, the drumbeat of the uh, the catastrophic loss of, of life and, and families over in the Middle East. Right now in markets, a little drama after getting a slightly hotter than expected CPI print, although you are seeing the S&P Futures rising just a touch once again, up two tenths of a percent, but yields still higher, less so than before. But 10 year yields still up by 3%. You could see a pop through 5% on the two year yield. I did want to just point to a couple of specific stories that I'm watching in the corporate space. Ford, we were talking about uh, having this potential for uh, further profit losses after yet another strike target. This one, the very profitable plant in Kentucky, which uh, manufactures the higher price super duty versions of F-series pickups. This is sort of the uh, the wild card, and they did it before. The Hail Mary, before. Really. Right. What I was struck by this, and I think you mentioned this earlier, was the timing of this. We were not expecting this this morning. It's not the Friday morning Facebook Live that Sean Fain is used to. And, and our Bloomberg journalist reporting saying that when Ford failed to go higher in a meeting last night, Sean Fain apparently stood up and said, quote, if there's not a better offer, then you just lost KTP. And KTP is really like the crown jewel. And this was a $23, I believe. 23%. Uh, 23%, excuse me, uh, raise that they were going to be given. I did just want to draw your attention quickly to a couple of other names. Delta, we were saying, did come in with a forecast on the lower end of expectations. Still, those shares up 3.4%, uh, basically not as bad as people expected. So they are managing, and maybe it's because prices are going up just a touch, as Michael McKee was just talking about. And Walgreens Boots Alliance came in with a worse than expected forecast for 2024, talking about cost cutting, which is interesting because this is what people are looking for. When will potential losses to margins end up in people maybe losing their jobs or other trimming uh, around the edges after already having cut so far? We do want to parse through what the response has been to the CPI report. Joining us now, David Kelly, Chief Global Strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. I just would love to get your thoughts, David, on uh, whether the uh, CPI, the PPI coming in hotter than expected moves the needle anywhere on your radar, even just a touch? No, not really. Uh, first of all, on the CPI, I think it was close to being exactly on expectations. The one thing that seemed to be stronger than people had expected was um, hotels. Uh, hotel rates had fallen a very sharp 3.6% in the prior month. They jumped 4.2% this month. And that was one of the things that pushed up shelter costs. And if you take that out, there's, there's really not much else going on here. Meanwhile, we're looking very closely at the price of gasoline because what's happening is even though crude oil prices are holding in at fairly high levels, we've seen refiner margins come crashing down. And so the price of a gallon of gasoline is now 19 cents lower than it was a month ago. And so I think that bodes well for, for a better reading for October CPI. So right now, I think we're still on track. I think we're on track for CPI, for year over year headline CPI being at 2% or less in the fourth quarter of next year and the consumption to phase also being at 2% or less by the fourth quarter of next year. And that's one year ahead of the Fed's target. And, and that's, the, you know, so overall, this report makes me, re I'm, you know, I'm still very optimistic that inflation is coming down. And meanwhile, we do have these other issues. I mean, we, do, we, had, we have this expanding UAW strike. I think the uh, continued sort of chaos in Washington makes it quite possible that we'll have a government shutdown um, in November. So I think there are, uh, you know, there's still plenty of weights on the economy here. And certainly when I look at inflation, I still think it's coming down. When you look at this report, though, very much so feels like status quo. How much harder is it going to be to get to that 2%? Well, I don't think it's going to be that hard. I mean, it's a lot of this has to do with year over year changes and, and basis. So if you look at the core CPI, it came down from 4.4% year over year to 4.1%. And actually core is going to keep on coming down. Uh, over the next next few months. And, and then, you know, as I said, I, I think the energy story is gradually getting better. I think the economy will grow more s slowly in the fourth quarter and next year. So, and, th and then the last thing is shelter. We know that, that owner's equivalent rent, actual rents, as, as the government reports some lag reality on the ground when it comes to negotiated rents. And we're not seeing any increase going on in the actual rental market. We're not seeing any increase going on in actual new car prices uh, since the start of this, this year. So we think that that will all tend to push away at transportation or cut away at transportation services and at shelter costs. And that's really where our forecast of 2% inflation by the end of next year is coming from. Does that make you bullish or bearish? 
Um, slightly, slightly bullish. I think the I think you have to pick and choose here. The overall U.S. equity market's not cheap, uh, but it's very bifurcated between those uh, top ten stocks or top seven stocks and everything else. The rest of the market is looking like pretty good value here. And I'd also say the bond market's pretty good value here. I mean, if you if if I'm right that inflation gets down to two percent then a 10-year Treasury at about 4.5% sounds about right. And we actually could get a little bit of a capital gain when inevitably we trip into recession at some stage in the next year or two. We've been trying to wrap our head around some of the whipsaw action that we've seen in 10-year Treasury yields and 30-year Treasury yields. We've had softer than expected uh, auctions yesterday, the 10-year. Today we have one of the 30-year. There's been a question of how much is technical and how much is a larger lack of certainty about what the ultimate inflation paradigm is going to look like, not to mention uh, fiscal. From your vantage point, does this volatility make this market less investable or more investable? Well, it's, it, it's, it's disconcerting, of course, for investors. But if you're a long-term investor, just look at the prices and don't worry about the day-to-day -day action. Uh, because a lot of this is whipsaw, as you say. But over the course of a year or two years or 10 years, um, it, it'll diminish. I do think that there, there is something important going on, on the fiscal side. And we just got the Congressional Budget Office numbers uh, on their estimates uh, on the budget deficit on, on Monday evening. And it looks, it looks like this fiscal year, it, it, or last fiscal year, came in at $1.7 trillion. This fiscal year, probably about $2 trillion. You add in the fact that the Fed is you know, uh, returning bonds to the market. And the federal government is having to borrow about 2 dollars to $3 trillion every year from global public capital markets. And that is an enormous lift. And that does suggest that when, when long-term yields come down, they're not going to come down to you know, 1% or 2%. There is a floor to how low long-term bonds can come down. So what I'd say is you know, buy bonds for income, buy them for, to diversify your portfolio, uh, but don't expect a big capital gain from bonds because I think there is a limit to how far rates could fall given how much the government has to borrow. When you look at the fiscal trajectory, though, of the United States, you see a lot of the dysfunction that goes on in Washington. The fighting is about a very small sliver of the U.S. budget. Is, can we ever really deal with the fiscal health of the United States until we start looking at the defense budget or things like entitlements, these mandatory spending right. measures? Well, it's not, it's not just on the spending side, it's also on the tax side. I mean, we, the reason we have big budget deficits today is because we had two huge wars over a very long period. We had two major tax cuts, one of them which was extended. Um, and, we've had, uh, and we've had a pandemic and a global financial crisis in which the government just poured money at the problem. And we didn't pay for any of it. The reason we've got big budget deficits is, is because politicians t treat us like children uh, and we accept it. Um, so the, uh, the, I, I completely agree with you that what they're talking about today is just a complete sideshow. You can't deal with the budget deficit without either raising taxes or cutting defense, Medicare, Medicaid uh, and Social Security or both. You simply can't. Um, and we need to have th these tough discussions, but I don't expect that anytime soon. So I think we will be looking at rising deficits or rising debt and, and very high deficits for many years to come. David Kelly of J.P. Morgan Asset Management, thank you so much for being with us. We did get that hotter than expected CPI print. We are getting a muted reaction in markets. Our focus very much today has also been on what's going on in uh, the Middle East. Tony Blinken over there meeting first with Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, now currently meeting with Israeli President Isaac Herzog. We've heard also from Iran saying that the Palestinians acted alone. What are you watching for today, Emery? Um, I really was looking at Blinken's comments, saying that Israel has the right, indeed has the obligation in his words to defend itself. But he also said that how they do this, how Israel does this matters. And he's obviously talking about how difficult a ground invasion into Gaza will be and how that will look like. And we heard about that earlier from someone who has been uh, part of some of those types of ground operations. Uh, this has been Bloomberg Surveillance coming up on Bloomberg TV at 10 a.m. Ralph Schlostein of Evercore amid a fraught moment geopolitically and economically.